I'd like to call this meeting to order. This is the Wednesday, August 13, 2014, special budget meeting. Would everyone please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. City Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Yes, Your Honor. Commissioner Kim Benzie? Here. Commissioner Campana? Here. Commissioner Coyne? Here. Commissioner Reynolds? Here. Commissioner Ryan? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Stonehouse? Here. And Mayor Nimi? Here. Thank you, City Clerk. Uh, our commissioners, are there any agenda changes? Or staff, any agenda changes? Okay, hearing none, is there a motion to approve the agenda? Commissioner Kim Benzie? I move that we approve the agenda as presented. Okay, is there a second? Commissioner Ryan? Second the agenda. Okay. Motion. It's been moved by Commissioner Kimbenzi, seconded by Commissioner Ryan to approve the agenda as presented. All in favor say yes. 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 Anyone opposed say no. The motion passes unanimously. I don't have any announcements tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the next section is citizen comment. Any citizens desiring to address the commission, you may address for three minutes. Please state your name and physical address when making public comments. And we have a new system now of lights. Uh, it counts down from three minutes. The first two minutes, it'll, it, the green light will be illuminated. At one minute, the yellow light will illuminate in a, in a uh, solid configuration and at 30 seconds it'll start flashing and when the time is expired it'll turn red so please uh, finish your comments by the time the light turns red uh, anyone wishing to address the Commission okay we do and Hello, my name's uh, Dave Bett. I'm uh, at 1039 Alloway. I've uh, been resident of Marquette since 1974. Uh, I have a boat at the Presque Isle Marina, and uh, I'm here to speak in support of the marina. I've uh, uh, met a lot of you folks, uh, attended various uh, meetings of the Harbor Committee, and uh, worked meetings with the City Commission, and spoke before. Uh, and one of the things that's I'm dismayed at a lot of the negativity that I hear in, with regard to the Presque Isle Marina um, the, the marina docks require replacement. The rest of the facility, the office, the showers, the break wall, the harbor basin, is really in quite good repair. The docks are, are uh, uh, still usable, but however, they do need to be replaced. Uh, so I, I hear a lot of stuff being thrown around. Um, one of the things at the, at the last planning meeting, the $4 million cost was constantly presented as the cost of replacement. I, that was an unrealistic number. It uh, included the, a lot of things that have already been rejected. If you look at the 2010 uh, engineering report, the cost to replace the docks, which, as I explained, are the only thing that's bad, the two, do the two existing docks, which would preserve the marina as it is for the same number of slips, is m closer to a million and a half, half of which would be funded by grants. So that's the, the number that you should have in your head. Forget the four million. That was for something that no one is even proposing and hasn't for some, some period of time. Um, so with the possibility of future expanding, because there was a third dock and there's space to put in a third dock in the future, that would be about another half to $600,000 if uh, there was a, proved to be a demand for those slips and there was money available. Um, Mr. Vita stated that the public marinas are in trouble all over the state, and I'm sure you can give examples, and I'm sure that's not uh, untrue, but there's also marinas that are doing quite well. Um, Unising is expanding, Lons is expanding, Melbourne Way is expanding, and so I think that we need to be asking, well, what's, what's our problem? Why aren't we doing, why are we one of the ones that's not doing well? Um, I don't think it's just because, you know, everybody, it's, everybody's got the same problem. I don't believe that's true. We have a problem. A look at the financial statement from past years makes me wonder if we aren't doing a little better than what's being presented. Um, you know, because I, I, I look at it and the cash flow looks pretty good. There's a lot of expenditures which are city to city type expenditures, administrative stuff, and I've got some experience with uh, you know large bureaucracies, and I know when you make these financial statements, 
a lot of these expenditures are estimated. It's easy to make things look a little better, a little worse, depending on what you emphasize and what you don't. A uh, small example, um, the Presque Isle Marina is charged $800 a year for stormwater. Um, that's the cost is based on the size of the parking lot because you have to remove the stormwater through the two 15-foot culverts that go directly into the bay. Um, I would like to propose to the commission that I could do that for half the money, $400 a year, and still have sufficient money left over to buy all the beer of Anglos after the meeting. Your time is I really hope that you preserve the marina. Presque Isle is a beautiful spot, and uh, it would be a blot to let it go to pot. I'm sorry, I've ceded my time. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to address the commission? I'm Ellen Betwood. I'm also a citizen of Marquette, and I also have a boat at the marina. This is your address? 1039 all the way. Um, I would just like to say that um, Presque Isle Marina is a special place. We bring our grandchildren there, and they stay on the boat for weekends, and they see deer and beaver and mink, and um, it's a jewel of Marquette. And I think, you know, the citizens of Marquette were in an uproar about a boathouse on a crummy beach at Founders Landing. What would you think they would think of an abandoned marina at the base of the jewel of the park? And what will we do if we don't if we don't maintain this marina? What's going to happen with it? We have funding to re maintain it now. If we let it die, who's going to fund to, to tear it out? It's going to be there disintegrating at the mouth of our our famous marina, our famous park. I'd also like to say that um, I had the opportunity to meet the mayor of Roatan, and that's a Caribbean paradise. And he told us that he'd been to Marquette. Michigan a, n a number of times and that's the only place his kids would want to go on vacation And do you think it was because of downtown? It was all our parks and that's what they talked about but when they come here they spend their money downtown. I Think it's important for us to maintain our parks as well as our downtown. I love our downtown, but our parks are important also and That's all I have to say Thank you Anyone else wishing to address the commission? Anyone else wanting to address the commission? Seeing none, we'll proceed with the consent agenda. On the consent agenda, we have approved minutes of the August 12, 2014 special budget meeting. Commissioners, what is your pleasure with this? Commissioner Coyne? I move we approve the consent agenda. Okay. Is there a second? Commissioner Reynolds? Second. Commissioner Coyne, anything further? No. Okay, Commissioner Reynolds, anything further? No. Okay. It's been moved by Commissioner Coyne, seconded by Commissioner Reynolds to approve the minutes of the August 12, 2014 special budget meeting. All in favor say yes. 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 Anyone opposed say no. The motion is approved unanimously. We're now to new business, uh, the community services budget. Mr. Manager, would you like to give an introduction or thank you Ron. I guess I would and then uh, I'll turn it over uh, to lead us through the rest of the presentation uh, with director Zuger but uh, just uh, to provide a little bit of background for folks who might be watching uh, who haven't seen this segment of the presentation before uh, although uh, this financially represents only three percent of the budget as you saw from the overview slides yesterday it really speaks to about a hundred percent of what the public sees in terms of their contact with the city uh, if you're uh, ever in need of police perhaps you might come in contact with them if you're ever in need of the fire department perhaps you might come in contact with them most people don't see the subsurface infrastructure that carries the water and the wastewater back and forth from their homes uh, they don't pay too much attention to the electrical utilities or the the uh, cable bills until they show up every month uh, when streets gets pl get plowed uh, it becomes kind of an ubiquitous thing so most of the view that the residents have of the city 97% uh, of the budget that that you're very familiar with is, is largely unknown and and uh, uh, something that most of the public normally doesn't focus on so although this is only 3% of the budget uh, as for those commissioners who've been here for some time uh, no this can be some of the most challenging 
trade-offs in terms of policy judgment that you can make. And it really speaks to, from our, from our zero baseline budget that we were discussing yesterday, uh, some of the larger challenge, challenges that we face and the recommendations that are coming forward. To that extent, we appreciate the passion that you've even heard tonight and concur with the views of residents in terms of how important all of those recreational park, art and culture opportunities are to the community. That is what provides for the most important element for our residents, their quality of life, and make sure that they're happy every day uh, along with all of the regular utilities that, and other services that they receive. And no more an area is, is there challenging than trying to figure out a way to keep all of those in good repair, keep a fair and equitable access for everybody, and make sure that uh, we're not achieving anything other than cost neutrality in the way that we're managing those parks. We're not a commercial enterprise. We're at best looking to make sure that we cover the, cover the costs and that we provide the best possible care and maintenance to those facilities that we possibly can. And so uh, I had the opportunity to laud uh, Chief Belt. I had the opportunity to laud uh, Chief Angeli yesterday. Uh, when they're the number one priority of the city commission, uh, it's very easy to give them that kind of top cover. Uh, sometimes the trades that Carl has to deal with every day, you see them through 24-hour response requirements. You see them potentially both when our residents are happy as well as when they're frustrated or have anxiety. Uh, and I'd like to thank him for the grace that he exudes every day as he's dealing with those particular challenges, but also the extraordinary thoughtfulness that he's put into trying to make this part of our budget work this year. Uh, I know he, more than anybody, had to review all of the plans, all of the strategy, all of the feedback that we've received from the various different boards and committees, the commission, the residents of the community over the course of the last year to try to make sure that we find the best possible way to start the year and, more importantly, establish the best possible hope for finishing it in a, in a better position than we started. So with that, thank you, Carl, and I'll turn it over to him to lead us through the evening. Thank you. Really, thank you. I really appreciate that. And thanks to the Commission for giving us um, the confidence uh, to do what we do. Um, one thing I would say about our staff is that I'm very proud of the staff and what you see tonight and what we're going to talk about tonight is not just the work that I do, but certainly everyone that comes to work every day that's committed to this community and, and, and to you all and the city manager. So I appreciate that. Um, Tonight's, uh, I looked at the, 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 uh, the agenda, and, and, it's, and what I'd like to start with is fees. I think we've got some creative things that we're going to propose to the commission, and I'll kind of explain it. Um, and that's not on your list of um, pages, and so I will go through each page and, and let you get there. But before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about some of the creative concepts that uh, we're bringing forward to the commission. Um, the um, genesis of our what we're calling the differential rate um, really came from the recreation authority discussions um, and really trying to create an equity between the resident and the non-resident. So this is not sort of a, a gap closing measure, but really trying to create that, that measure of equity. So if a resident is paying X amount of dollars for a rental, we want it to be the same thing for the non-resident. So everyone's paying the same amount, whether it be renting a facility or participating in a program. And so what we did is we looked at it um, from, and what we hear often is, you know, what is the taxpayer? What is the resident paying? And so we went to the uh, city assessor and we said, well, how many you know, 401 class properties are there in the city, and 401 class properties are those that are one to four, you know, um, uh, numbers of units within a home. So it could be a single or it could be up to four units. And, and in the city, there's just over 5,100 of those. Um, the average tax value, uh, we looked at that. We looked at the millage rate. We looked at the average annual tax capture. And then we started to look at what... Um, what types of or how much um, is being subsidized for each one of our facilities, whether it be Parks and Rec, whether it be Arts and Culture, or whether it be a Lakeview Arena. And so we came up with percentages for facilities and miscellaneous fees, and these are non-resident fees, 
and um, and then we also came up with a participation per household fee and what that means is is if someone were to rent a facility at Presque Isle um, that's a resident is actually paying more than what um, uh, a non-resident is paying based on the tax subsidy and so we looked at those facilities and parks and rec facilities it's about 35 percent so we increased the, and so we established a non-resident fee um, that is 35 percent above what a resident would pay because it is equitable it is the difference um, arts and culture it's 35 percent and then Lake View Arena it's 25 percent so this would be in terms of a non-resident coming in and using those facilities uh, or renting those facilities in terms of the non-resident participation, what we looked at is a household fee. And this would be a household fee for those that are receiving specific services. And in the parks and rec side, it's baseball and soccer. And um, so an example of that is someone comes in and pays $100 to register to play a baseball with a little league. The non or the resident is actually paying $120 uh, because there is a subsidy there um, from the general fund tax dollars. And so what we're suggesting is that it would be a household um, participation fee. In baseball, it's $20. Soccer, it's $5. Arts and culture would be $20 per, you know, per household for the year for programming. Um, and then Lakeview Arena, it would be $35. And this would be per family. Um, our uh, the good thing that we've done this year is we have established um, our, uh, a new software package that will help us with this, but we're also going to have to work diligently with our user groups that participate um, on our facilities. And so if we were to get um, support from the commission, we'd like to get moving on that as quickly as possible. So that sort of, you know, sort of tees up when we start to look at these fees, and, and it will make sense now, you know, sort of how I explain it to you, how we came to those increments and how we came to those non-resident fees. Once again, these are differential fees. These aren't going to make up, you know, the, the huge gaps in terms of the general fund, perhaps subsidies, but it is, you know, the, the resident, the non-resident that's coming in and participating in or using city facilities, um, it is equitable to those that are that would rent it that are a resident and so it's just making everybody pay the same thing and so if, if that makes sense um, the first uh, set of fees is on page 18 and what you see and if everyone can get to that page Um, Carl, before you, you get, well, before we all get too deep, I guess, in the weeds on this, um, let me um, uh, let me just point out something too that I, people, I know the commission is aware of it because we went through it when we did the debrief on the recreation study, the uh, the multi-jurisdictional recreation authority study. But one of the items that that study brought out, uh, they quoted. City of Marquette is spending $64.41 per resident for recreation. And we all questioned that, I think, because we thought that was way too low. <coughs> and in retrospect, uh, the city went back and, and did some digging and came up with a number that was closer to $140 per resident. And that's when we include capital expenses and bond debt and related issues or re related expenses that were not included in the original 64. But when you put that in contrast with our surrounding communities, it is quite startling. Uh, for example, Marquette Township is $7.05 per resident for recreation. Uh, Chocolate Township is $13.78 per resident. So what I'm suggesting is that uh, I think we're, uh, where the fees are leading us, uh, really very interesting and uh, certainly backed up, I think, by the empirical data of the study itself. Which, uh, which really lays out it very starkly, the difference in expense and the difference in cost between what the city is providing and what other communities may be providing around us. So I just wanted to make sure we all understood that and realized that uh, that might be an overarching issue that we need to keep, uh, keep our attention on. Thank you, Carl, for your time. I'd just like to also point out real quick, it, it, 
you know, differential fees are also supported by the ICMA, which is the International City Managers Association and the National Parks and Recreation Association. These are things that are not unique to, we're not suggesting something unique. These things are supported by those, uh, those organizations. So when we, when we look at the arts and culture, and I'll just start with that, which is on page 18, you see that there are two columns, resident, non-resident. The non-resident fee would be a 35% uh, increase, and that once again is your differential um, between what a resident would pay and what a non-resident would pay um, based upon the general fund contribution. Um, that's uh, consistent um, all the way down, as you see. The, the, we did take out the uh, gift shop we struck that because, quite honestly, we're not in the gift shop business anymore. And um, I would point out that we made one addition to this year's fee structure, and that is admin, I'm sorry, marketing and admin fee, which is $13 per hour plus, plus materials. Um, our staff does a considerable amount of work for um, uh, NGOs in the community, other interests. Um, in the past, we've done it at no cost. This was be an opportunity for us to capture those costs. Um, these are the posters that you see out, some of the work that we do with um, uh, PSAs. Um, we support distribution. Um, this would be an opportunity for us to actually capture some of those dollars. And those are the $13 per hour is, is, what, it, is what the rate is for one of our part-time employees. So um, it's, it's, you know, trying to cover those costs. Commissioner Coyne? Sort of in follow-up to uh, Mayor Pro Tem's comments, <clears throat> how do you set the fee for a resident for $25, $75, $100? Is that arbitrary or is that based on something? It was our understanding that the commission, um, that we really didn't want to increase a lot of our fees to our residents this year um, and the fees that we have been using. And so we, we, we used the fee that was there. Um, as you know, uh, we did look at break-even fees, and so there are, you know, they are subsidized somewhat by the general fund, um, but we did not want to increase those to our residents. Why? Um, I guess that was what we thought the belief of the commission was, and, you know, is not to necessarily increase those rates. Uh, let, me, let me step in for Carl, too. Uh, we... From last year's discussion, recall the mood of the commission, recall the mood towards taxes and fees. And for some departments, and we'd mentioned this yesterday, they went back as part of that zero baseline and determined what the cost of providing service was. In the case of arts and culture and park and recreation, that discussion has come up annually as part of this budget process, and it always spurs the largest discussion between commission members and it's not effectively been resolved in any given year. And it's not that commissioners are arguing about which or who or what should be getting the breaks, uh, but it's the, the process for at what point will the, will the user stop seeking to use facilities if they have to bear the full cost of actually providing those facilities. And it's come up with cemetery plots. It's come up with ice time. It's come up with a variety of things. And the consistent answer over the last four years has been that the fees are approximately where the commission believes the market will bear. They don't want to see increases, and they accept that as part of the consequences and part of the value taxpayers get from living in Marquette, that some level of subsidy is appropriate. There's an issue of policy. Uh, it would be better to have those facilities available and used by people for a reasonable rate than to try to charge the full rate and see diminished use of the facilities. And so we, we based that decision on past experience from this discussion. Thank you. If there's no other questions, we'll proceed to page 27. Can I, can I ask? Oh, yes. Okay, Menzi. For like for the workshop room, hourly for 50 minutes is 25. Um, so if the art center puts on a workshop and it's just an hour long one time, 
that would be the price that a resident would pay to do that workshop regardless of what it well, is? You know, if they're participate, I mean, well, there's a, it, it, for a program or for a rental? Well, I'm reading... I mean, if it is a if it is a rental from a workshop, that would be someone outside of the Arts and Culture Center using those facilities. Yeah, if I might, Carl, the twenty five dollars an hour would be the the actual entity renting the room. If they want to use that to put the maximum capacity allowed by the fire code and okay. charge X number of people to participate in that hour, that's a completely separate transaction. This would just be for renting the space. Okay, got it. Um, and then the. The other one with the exhibitor gallery space, I know now the city has taken that on. Is that still going to happen, or are we trying to get people every month to rent it and do Yeah, and I can touch base when we get into the arts and culture budget. I mean, if you will, I mean, I'd, okay. if we can wait on that, then I can talk about the operations. Okay. Proceed. Okay. Or is there? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But my question was just was that do you think that the resident non-resident fees or maybe Tina, just based upon this, do you think that it'll thwart any people coming in doing these things just based on nine dollars? You know, you know, for that exact example, do you yep. think? When we worked at the budget, we thought it would be about a fifty percent loss. That's how we looked at it. Anything further? Any commissioners? Okay. Proceed, Carl. The next uh, set of fees is Lakeview Arena on page 27. If everyone is there, once again, we have uh, resident, non-resident fees, as you can see as they proceed down the schedule. Um, we did suggest increasing the ice rates to 170 per hour for prime time, 115 for non-prime time, and 200 for tournament. Um, that is uh, the 170 per hour is consistent with what Northern will have next year. We try to be consistent with the market, and um, that will be consistent. The tournament ice, uh, we're suggesting 200. Um, this is supported by the notion that we have a two additional Zamboni drivers anytime we do have a tournament. So we'll have four part-time employees versus two part-time employees, and that, um, and that warrants an additional $25. Um, other than that, when you proceed down, uh, the drop in figure skating, that rate didn't exist last year. We're suggesting that. We did have uh, interest in that last year, and we didn't have a fee to you know, we didn't have a fee to charge, and so we want to be able to provide that. And then we also have the season pass for the drop-in figure skating. Um, the other new permit that you'll see this year is a special alcohol permit, and this, is, this supports the ordinance. Um, and uh, this will be for, uh, might be um, whether it's a tournament that's uh, selling um, alcohol mm -hmm. or weddings or might be dry floor events. They will have uh, the requirement of a $50 special alcohol permit. And once again, that's part of your ordinance. Um, and then we eliminated the, uh, the linens, which uh, we don't have linens, so we struck it. Um, but other than that, it's uh, pretty consistent uh, with the exception of those that I outlined and then the non-resident fees. Yep. The non-resident fee in ice time, I guess I'm not sure I don't understand how that works. Well, if you there's... You have to pay yep. three, $270 per hour and then $35 for every person on the ice or what? No, the, oh. the <laughs> participation fee will be for someone that's going to participate in um, a league okay. within so like Lakeview Arena. Yeah, so junior hockey. Yeah. And that's, just to clarify, that's $35 per household. So if they have one skater, it's 35 If they have four skaters in that household, it's still $35, consistent with what a 401 property would okay. contribute. The, I guess the, uh, 
the break even fee of three hundred twenty dollars per hour. How do you calculate that? That's calculated okay. with all of our operational costs and then the number of hours that the ice is is available. Is that twenty four hours a day? Um, for the ice time, yep. I mean, while it's not twenty four hours a day, it's um, when you look at it, it's. Uh, uh, non prime time is 11 p.m. to 3 p.m., and then, yeah, so it is 24 hours a day. Okay. Do you have an actual, can you calculate a marginal cost of, of ice? We haven't, but we okay. could. Yeah. Because I, I guess, you know, that would certainly be important to know because if we're, if our marginal cost is $220 and we're charging only $170, we're subsidizing every hour by $50. And we need to, I think at the minimum, we need to cover our out-of-pocket costs for, for any activity. Okay. We'll look into that. Okay. Any other questions with Lakeview Arena's fee schedule? Commissioner Kim Benzie. Can you just explain, so say I'm a parent who has a son playing hockey, how will this affect me? And I sign up for the junior hockey league and I'm on a team how does this the if you're if you are a, a resident you will pay what the league um, registration costs will be okay. if you are a non-resident you will pay the same registration fees but you will also be responsible for an additional thirty five dollars per household okay once again it doesn't matter if it's one player or if it's four players coming from the same household okay Got so it. We're encouraging large families. <laughs> <laughs> no, a bunch of small families, actually. <laughs> Anything else, any commissioners? Uh, you know, I could yes. give a speech yeah. now or give it later, but I, I just don't agree with the whole philosophy, and I'm the only one who feels that way probably. So I don't think it helps us to charge non-residents more. You know, we're going we're gonna to add at best $10,000 and probably not that much in a $2 million or $20 million budget to say to our neighbors, no, you can't, you know, you got to pay more to participate with us. And I, I'm, I, you know, this commission wants that, so I'm not blaming you, but uh, I just don't agree with it. So, okay. Proceed, Carl. Sure. Um, page 28, or we get into the marina fees. There's no changes. Um, these are the, the fees that the commission approves that goes to waterways. Um, so there's no changes with that page. Can, excuse me. We can't charge a non-resident fee for this, can we, because of the waterways contribution? Well, on the next page. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> page 29. <laughs> okay. <laughs> on page 29, okay. um, you see the same you know, the same fees that the commission's approved with the exception of the winter boat storage rate. Um, we, we did um, increase the resident to uh, $1.10 per square foot. And then uh, the non-resident, we went to $1.65. Okay. And one of the things that we do when we look at these rates, we look at what the for-profits are, you know, what they're charging, whether it be, um, uh, exposed, you know, storage to covered storage, and um, you know we don't want to necessarily compete with the privates, and so right. um, we try to be somewhere in the middle. The other thing that we included in this year's um, fee schedule on the, is a non-resident waiting list fee, and uh, we increased that to thirty-five dollars for a non-resident. And this would be for those boat owners that um, um, uh, want to uh, reserve uh, the potential of being in one of the marinas. So if the marina is full, then they pay a fee to be placed on a list. Um, residents were suggesting it's $25, and non-resident is $35. And, you know, it is something that we do um, that's uh, – uh, part of the policy that the state gives us. Um, but in these types of fees, they allow for quite a bit of local latitude. Any questions with marinas? And we'll move on to parks and recreation on page 30. Um, 
I guess at the top, well, is everyone there? At the top, we did uh, we, we changed the fee structure with our picnic sites. It was $100, um, but we found that, uh, or that what we believe is that we'll have more use of it if we go to a per hour charge. Um, in many cases, we have groups that want to come in and use it for a few hours and charging $100 for a few hours to be at the park. Um, this would be at Tourist Park. We have three picnic sites, by the way. Um, it discourages them, and we think that we may get more activity if we go to a per hour charge, and so we determined to do that. The other thing with Tourist Park was we did take out the 14 days, and the commission approved that earlier this year through a, in a, a, uh, an agenda item. It's not compatible with our software, and so our, it doesn't make sense for us, and so we eliminated that. Um, you do see the non-resident fees for the facilities at Presque Isle Marina or Presque Isle Park. Um, and the other thing that is significant in this budget is we did uh, break out baseball and soccer. Um, and this is going to be different than it was last year. Um, baseball, we are increasing the per team fee to $130 per team. High school uh, team fee will be the same, $130. And we increased the game fee to uh, $20 uh, per game. Um, and then we have a non-resident participation fee of $20. The soccer, uh, we actually reduced it. Um, and the reason that we did that is uh, we feel like um, the reduced fee is more proportionate to uh, what is being received, and um, we also think that we're making up some of the difference in that we're going to add a, an adult soccer league um, or team fee, um, and you see that below that. Uh, in addition to that, there's an adult tournament fee. Um, and so those are different. Uh, we think it's more equitable. Uh, last year they were both kind of grouped together, which we didn't think was equitable. Um, and we think it will be uh, well received within the public. I'm sorry. Keep moving. Um, I have one question about baseball. Is it by any chance did you use the number of fields and what it costs to kind of care for the number sure. of fields? Because um, I know that's something that right now I, I think we've heard from you, and, and certainly some of us feel that you know, they all want to use them at the prime times of the day, but perhaps we might have too many. Well, that's that's a good question. Um, you know, we have nine fields that we take care of. It's uh, total cost for baseball fields is one hundred sixty-seven thousand dollars, and uh, last year we brought in ten thousand five hundred. Um, so we have a pretty significant, you know, general fund subsidy of those facilities. And um, baseball numbers have stabilized come and, and, and or perhaps come down. That's a national trend. Um, and it's no different in this community. Um, I think that most of our baseball um, uh, leagues are predominantly after uh, work hours. Most of them are volunteers, volunteer parents that are out there either coaching or, you know, helping out with the leagues. And so um, most of the fields sit vacant during the day and, um, you know, on the weekends. Um, it's, this is mainly Monday through Friday. Really, it's probably Tuesday through Thursday. And um, they're, you know, very heavily used during those periods. Uh, tournament play is certainly on the weekends. And, you know, those could be all day long. Just, uh, yeah, I'm just wondering if there's a way to consolidate some of the fields um, just to drive the cost down. But then, similar to Lakeview, I mean, during the peak times, maybe there is a, yeah. a price differential. Or maybe there's certain fields reserved just for youth and certain fields reserved for, you know, high school or adults. And... Just trying to look at it, I mean, it it bothers me a little bit that we're increasing for one and reducing for another. I understand the cost differences between the two. Um, but <laughs> I know this isn't easy, and I appreciate everything you're doing. I think it's 
for us as commissioners, it's it's probably going to be pretty hard to stand behind, you know, that the up and the down, and then. Your Honor, maybe before I have Carl respond, I just wanted to point out for for the commission members, you'll see the column on the rightmost side. That's the where the fee would need to be set to be at a cost neutral basis. So having it not subsidized by the general fund. And so we're not, to, to your uh, uh, comment, Commissioner, we're, we're not in a position where the any raise we would propose would get us up to the level of break even. We're, we're at the point where we're really discussing how much of a subsidy are you looking at providing to make sure that those activities are available to youth in the community. The other thing I, I'd offer is we specifically asked our surrounding communities to include everything in the inventory. So not just where we ended up in the recommendation from the ad hoc group, but we asked them to include our baseball fields, our soccer fields, our parks, our swimming pools, all of the other things that the community as a whole identifies as being important to them for park and recreation, art and culture, and quality of life. And they specifically demurred from including anything other than what the Hartwood Forest uh, was. And so although their residents might very specifically be interested in participating, the other jurisdictions demurred on uh, on what would have been for us a great solution, which would have been for all for the entire community inside and outside the city's jurisdictions that uses all these facilities. Let's all co-own them. Let's all co-manage them. And let's all co-finance them. And uh, we specifically were uh, dissuaded from that view based on based on the recommendations that came forward. So it, it fundamentally comes down to what Carl's proposing isn't isn't even reaching what would be the break even cost of providing these services to our resident. Uh, it's really speaking to how much of a subsidy from the general fund would you like to contribute in lieu of something else we might use the general fund for to make these facilities available to our residents? And I, I fully understand that and I fully support that and I am certainly a commissioner that you know recognizes that we are bearing the full cost of these facilities, just about the full cost. Um, just, just a question, have we looked at, you know, instead of a per team fee, again, the resident and non-resident, um, instead of looking at it as a whole soccer team or a whole baseball team? Well, one of the things that we do have, and we don't do the programming, of course, um, uh, but what we did put in is a non-resident participation fee. And uh, so the non-resident from, uh, from a baseball perspective is $20. The non-resident for a soccer is $5. Um, and that's, you know, what a 401 class property owner would 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 be paying and not receiving any any services um, and so um, that's that's your you know your equity piece Mr. Coin um, I'd like to go back to the, this fee structure you know Don mentioned this is all these numbers are going to amount to about ten thousand dollars is that correct oh I think it may be a little bit more but that's pretty close. okay well, uh, let me run by this and have you both all respond to it. The library um, has a fee, if you are a non-resident, of about $175, I think. And you can't use the library unless, if you live in Powell Township right now, uh, unless you pay that fee. And it doesn't matter whether you take one book out or 25, uh, that's, that's the cost that a city resident, and, and Fred, you mentioned, what figure did we figure out? One? $140. $140. My thought is, this is, you know, it's a start, but it really doesn't solve the problem of the inequity. If I'm a city resident, I'm paying $140 of my tax dollars uh, to, to provide uh, recreation for all these things. Why should not a... Um, non-resident if they want to use our stuff they don't pay they're 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 100 we're giving them a gift of 140 dollars basically 
uh, of free recreation. And that adds up. Now, would you please respond to that? Okay. <laughs> I, bo I don't care, both I, of you. I can. Let, let me maybe take a stab at it, and then I'll ask Carl to, to jump in. As I was sharing, this conversation is very familiar to us. We've had this discussion each year, and it, it has inevitably kind of resulted in uh, an unresolved issue from a policy standpoint for the commission. Carl, as, as, as the administration would argue that we should be setting all the fees at the break-even price, that irrespective of the policy issue of whether we're giving away services or giving our neighbors a break or, or how those costs might be borne across the, com the community at large versus just those residents uh, within our jurisdiction, uh, what, whatever it costs to run these facilities, we should be charging what it, what it costs to run the facilities. If there's any business owner out there, and, and on occasion we get, we get challenged with our sense of business acumen, uh, if, if it costs you $200 to sell a hamburger, then you're only selling it for $100. Uh, they're pretty expensive hamburgers, but you can't sustain that very long and keep your business open. And the, the rules of economics are a little bit different for government, but not that different for government. And so if you take out all of the, the non-economic issues, the basic answer is we should be charging, we should be charging a fee that's cost neutral, that, that meets our costs and, uh, and really nothing more. Then you step into the realm of policy. And the debate for the last several years has been at what point will people stop using the facilities if we raise the costs to that break-even level? And we've had this specific discussion for marinas. We've had this specific discussion for soccer fields. We've had this specific discussion for baseball fields, for mooring fields, for playgrounds. Uh, we've had this specific discussion for bike paths, for you no know, Cayman on trailheads, for boathouses. It's been out there. And it's never been resolved in a in a manner that allows us to address that fundamental economic question. And the closest explanation that I've heard yet that probably best describes the mood of the commission is when all of the dialogue has run its course, as they look at that subsidy as fundamentally something our residents expect because it contributes to their experience here within the city and their satisfaction and quality of life. And to the extent that we can continue to make that equitable so that everybody who's seeking those experiences pays their fair share, and to the extent that we can manage those expectations in a scalable way so that when times are good, we can be more generous, and when times aren't so good, that we can, we can try to the best of our ability to recover those costs. That's been about the most guidance and, that we've gotten from the commission and probably the best best sense of their mood. Uh, but, Your Honor, maybe I'll, I'll let... Wait, I want to respond to that before Carl does, if I could. Yes. Um, we just heard from the police and fire departments yesterday. No one is saying, gee, we ought to charge, you know, $250 every time uh, the fire department comes to a resident. That's part of why what we pay taxes for. Well, I, I think the city citizens pay taxes for recreation. They, they want that. I, my point is, we know it costs $140. I'm not saying that we should have every resident pay $140 if they're going to use a recreation facility. What I'm saying is that the non-resident who isn't paying any taxes should pay to be equitable $140. Yeah. Now, I, you're, you're saying the, the mood of the commission. I'm, I'm saying that I'd like to hear what the mood of the commission is on that point. Yeah. Let me, let me, and I appreciate that clarification, sir. Uh, when, when we say $140, that, that's quite literally, it's as though if you added up all of the park and rec facilities, all of the different art and culture facilities, everything that we do to provide that kind of service, that $140 is what everybody, whether you're using those services or not, is paying. That's the commitment from, from our tax dollars to do that. You know, in effect, 
everybody who lives in the city has got a $140 membership in Club Marquette that whether they're using it or not, uh, they're paying for it. And, uh, and if you don't live in the city, you're not. And right now we don't have a, a system of enforcement or membership cards or any of the rest of those things where uh, you could walk down the street and decide who's in the who's a city resident, who's not, if you're walking through the park. And in order to try to start dealing with that equity, uh, we came across we came at it two different ways. We went through the regional recreation study to try to identify what comparable levels of spending are within other communities in the area. Uh, we tried to do it through the method that Carl was describing, which is for uh, the type of, of uh, residential taxpayers that we're dealing with, what would be the average load per each individual activity that would give us some sense of what their contribution for that type of event already is, and use that as a baseline then for saying, in effect, if, if you want to go out and you want to use a tourist park picnic site, if you're a city of Marquette resident, you're already paying for that. That's part of what your tax dollars are. You've already donated your $10 for the use of that picnic site, whether you're using it or not. So to put you on an even, so if you're a non-resident, to get you on an even basis, whatever you're going to have to pay has to account for the fact that you're already $10 in the hole, just as an example. So why aren't we? Why aren't we doing that in uh, in an across the board kind of top like top line manner uh, uh, to what you're suggesting? We certainly could look at something like that. And in fact, as part of the discussion, maybe I'll turn it over to Carl uh, to kind of close this so that we can let the policy discussion begin. But you know, we actually looked at how metro parks were run as part of that regional rec study. What would it take if we were able to? Uh, turn essentially the entire park and rec and art and culture system into an enterprise fund where uh, you could buy into it as a private partner, you could pay dues in lieu of having to have it come out of taxes. Uh, we tried to find some way where if we were able to go out and see uh, if you had some enforcement in place, if there were park patrols and they were checking people's IDs to see if they were uh, properly permitted for being in there. We, we looked at a broad range of options for how we might be able to bring this up not just equitably, but to a point where it would break even. And at some point, this is going to require some very specific clarification from the City Commission about what their expectations for this are. Because there's a pretty broad gap between what they believe the, the residents and users of those facilities are willing to pay and what they actually cost us to run. And it's not something that should be subject to administrative judgment, specifically because it, it's part of the basic debate about what people's expectations are as part of the services they receive for being in the city and, and, and their quality of life. Could I just respond then? When is the time when that decision is going to be made? I mean, is it not tonight? This is when we're discussing the budget. That's, to me, when we should decide this. I agree, sir. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't like the idea of the analogy of uh, having the police department check everybody sitting at a picnic table. I don't think the picnic table is the issue. I think the issue is everybody who's using Lakeview Arena or everybody who's using a ball field should have should pay the $140 who is not a resident. Yeah. And not to not say, well, it's in, unenforceable if you go in the park. The park isn't where the issue is. The issue is using facilities. Yeah. I, mean, I, I just want to, uh, I, I just, uh, the whole point of all this is to make it hard on residents, uh, excuse me, hard on non-residents so they will begin to think of the need for a recreation authority. That's where I'm coming from because this is not solving anything, basically, other than buying ill will for $5 or $10. That isn't, that isn't accomplishing. What I want to happen is to make the non-resident pay and then the non-resident to get the message. This could be done cheaper if we had a recreation authority. And until that thought process occurs, th that isn't going to happen, period. Thank you, sir. I, I can't speak to that last part, but I can certainly tell you we concur with the first part of your statement, which is the reason we didn't offer up a solution that would have some kind of park patrol wandering around checking everybody's IDs. We just don't think that's a very desirable outcome and certainly not something we would want the, to even even suggest should be imposed on the community. So 
but just I'd offered that only to give you a sense of I asked people to take the blinders off and to to uh, think beyond the box, think of all possible outcomes, not necessarily because they would recommend them or agree with them, but to try to get a sense of what the full scope of options and costs would be. But as far as the second, the the, the first part and the last part of your statement, tonight certainly would be a good time to solve that problem from our perspective. And as far as the policy discussion goes, how the Regional Recreation Authority uh, dialogue is ongoing, we'd welcome the chance to hear the, the Commission's views on that. Mr. Ryan? Yeah, I guess I'd just like to give the other side of the story on why I feel the way I do. And I particularly like to focus on youth activities. You know, I, I think everyone would agree that youth activities are important. You know, we, we have to, having kids active and involved in things is a good thing. And we're part of that process, but we're just a part of the process. You know, we're so fortunate to have a group like Superior Land Soccer, Marquette Little League, Marquette Junior Hockey, Marquette Figure Skating. Here you have a lot of volunteers who live in the city and the township working to create youth opportunities for kids. I don't view those kids who are coming in and using our facilities as a burden on the city. Actually, I view them as a benefit because they're part of these teams. These teams are all paying fees. They make the system work. You know, that's that's what it's all about. If we drive them away, we're going to have smaller teams, less people using the facilities. And in the case of particularly the, the arena, the expense is not going to go away. It's there. You can probably shut down the softball fields or, or whatever, but uh, that's why I feel the way I do. You know, we're, we're creating opportunities for kids in our community yeah, it benefits some other kids too, but that benefits our programs as well. And, and I just, I, I just don't get this. Where, you know, there's there are so many things in this city where taxpayers don't foot the whole bill, and, and for some reason we want to do it on 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 youth sports. I, I just don't get it. Can I, can I re respond? Only to note that this is exactly uh, the same dialogue we annually have. And we're st we stand ready uh, to support whatever view the commission the commission would offer. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, the only comment I would make is you saw uh, based on this proposal where that leaves the the um, general fund subsidies. Uh, CFO Simpson brought that up yesterday. This would get us closer than we've ever been to breaking even. Um, uh, any any. Um, uh, decisions that you might take uh, either to abandon this or to replace it with something else would create a cascading requirement to go back and repropose the basic budget. Mr. Yeah. Well, I certainly understand Mike's side and I certainly understand Don's and I guess um, I just want to throw my expectation out there and that is that um, I do feel that we will have to subsidize um, Parks and Rec, I, I, there's no doubt about it, and I do think that the majority of residents agree with that. Mm -hmm. But I also think the majority of city residents want some sort of recognition for subsidizing the facilities that are used by the majority of people participating in recreation. And so I guess with everything we see, I would like to see not a per team but a resident, non-resident. I'd like to see the township residents who don't pay taxes pay more. I think it's extremely important for us to get the message across. I also think that we need to work with the associations that run our youth sports and start an education process on what exactly this costs city taxpayers and how much we subsidize it. I think it's extremely important that we start putting it out there. Otherwise, no one is going to pay attention. I think this is what Mike's getting at. We can't foot the bill and we can't subsidize it forever, but I also think we need to start educating you know, our surrounding jurisdictions that we do want this conversation. And you know, eventually, it might get to a point if things don't turn around for the city, we have to start cutting. So I guess, you know, I just want to put my opinion out there that I I think like the public library, is it painful for outside jurisdictions? Yes. Is it painful when you have to do it for such a good cause? Yes. I would say youth sports is one of the best causes we have. However, 
we need to have that conversation. We do need to start looking at the equity. And I'd like to see a higher fee for non-residents in the city. All right, just a sec. Commissioner Reynolds? It's my only comment because you're trying to catch the mood of the commission. I um, echo Sarah, and um, I think that this is fair based upon the fact that I think we do have to educate people. We can't just suddenly throw $140 and say this is what you have to pay. And I think that, to me, this looks fair. And in particular, I know that all of these youth teams, because I'm involved with a lot of them and I have kids involved in them, and they are all spending money in the city. All of them go get their shirts at Third Street Embroidery and all of them go to CASA for dinner. So they're still spending a lot of money in our city, and I think we shouldn't try to push them out and try to go somewhere else. So I think that this is good, and I think it's a good start. And that's all I have to offer. I'm going to weigh in here. <laughs> um, I I like Dr. Coyne's uh, uh, position, and and uh, you know I naively thought when we were going into the, the the recreational story that maybe we could do something here. Uh, you know I the ideal my ideal situation is that we turn everything over in senior center everything over to recreation authority. We all pay for it. And, uh, you know, I calculated we'd have to pay about 1.1 1, 1 mills. The townships would have to pay 1.1 1 .1 mills. We'd still be paying 60% of the, the freight. Uh, we'd pay 60% of the, or we'd be paying 60% of the cost of their facilities. They would be contributing a little bit to our facilities, but we'd all be paying the same thing. And that's really the way it, sh it should be. Turn it all over to a recreation authority. Let's get out of the, the parks and recreation business. Uh, and then let that board decide, you know, how much do they want to subsidize? You know, how important is, is youth hockey to keep the kids off the street? How much do they want to subsidize it? Uh, how important is, is, is are the parks, et cetera? How, you know, they can subsidize it by coming to us and saying, well, we're going to need 1.2 mills or 1.3 mills from you this year because we want to, we want to let kids play uh, Little League Baseball for free. We don't want to charge them. We want to keep them off the streets. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that uh, it, it, we went to the, this, this trails and this, this Hartwood Forest. You know, that's, you know, that's part of it. I'd, I'd turn that over in a, in a minute to, the, to the, the authority also. But, uh, you know, it's, this discussion is long past overdue, and I think we, we have to bite the bullet, and we're going to have to, to – I don't know if we, we do it, you know, your way or, or maybe go a step further like – uh, Commissioner Coyne is, is mentioning. Uh, I don't know what, you know, I guess that's what, you know, we're going to have to come to together as a group, but we have to do it. And you, you've done a, a very good job of giving us the, 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 the costs and et, et cetera. Um, and I think, you know, this is the year we have to step up uh, and, and uh, deal with this problem. And maybe our, our neighbors, I, you know, I, I value our neighbors. Uh, you know, many of them are, are Marquette residents. You know, we're Marquette residents. They grew up in the city. They moved out in the township, but they moved out in the township because they want to pay four mills in taxes. I live in the city and I pay 14 mills in taxes, and I, I don't mind doing that. You know, I've, I've been, you know, my whole life I've been a public employee, so I know what taxes, do, you know, can do for for a, for a governmental unit. Um, but it's just that, you know, we're asking our people to, you know, spend a million dollars, $1.2 million to subsidize parks out of a, what, about a 2.4, 2, 2 point, you know, maybe even a $3 million program. And uh, it's, you know, it's time that the, you know, the neighbors stepped up and, and, and paid. And either that or the neighbors stepped up and said, well, hey, let's all get together. Let's do this as, as one community instead of, you know, one community subsidizing the whole program. So uh, I think, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Dave. Uh, just as a point of knowledge, how much are we losing on Lakeview Arena? Is there a figure that we have? Like, what does Let's, it take each year to subsidize it? We've what, been just, as high just as, so people know. Yeah, I mean, it, and it's in your budget. Uh, we've been as high as four hundred thousand this 000. year. This year, we're proposing two hundred thirty-three thousand. This year will be two thirty-three. Two thirty-one. Why oh, so little? We'll get to that when we get okay. to that budget. <laughs> okay. So we're showing uh, gain here, gain for the city. Well, it's not a necessarily a gain. Well, not it's a gain, not a, but it's you're a decrease in the general fund contribution isn't as as much. Okay. Second question I might have, if I could, um, and it's probably too hard to do, but did we ever look at other cities and see how they approach this? You know, Iron Mountain, Kingsford. 
you know, Gladstone, Escanaba, have we looked at yeah. what's their policies, you know? Think, have, yeah, I'm sorry. You may or may not know, and I don't know if that would help or not, but yeah. I would always want to look at what's the competition mm -hmm. doing, you know, how are they handling it? Yeah, we look uh, at all the communities, not only in the UP, but throughout the state of Michigan and nationally. I mean, and we just, we understand that, you know, our, our closest market is the communities that you talk, that you speak to, and you know, quite honestly, the the way that they're managed are, are vastly different depending on which community you go to. Um, some communities are 100% volunteer based, um, with some of their recreation facilities, you know, specific to athletic facilities, and some are, uh, you know, partially funded. Um, so it's partnerships between, you know, leagues and and uh, the community. Um, they're they're just they're they're very different, and so you, you know it's it's um, and so it's not it's difficult to take an apples to apples comparison, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah. I can also add, uh, Commissioner, you can look at the quality of the facilities too. Uh, yeah. what, what we're speaking to is to try to sustain them over time. You can go to many communities and see where they might have got a grant to build it and provided no sinking fund, and it and it's now in a complete state of disrepair. And abandoned because uh, they have no no way to maintain it over time, and so th there's a wide variety of of what communities do to provide programming, what communities do to provide facilities, whether they staff that with part of their uh, regular city staff or whether they put that as part of the volunteer contributions, either formally or informally. There's a wide variety of it. And we addressed some of that in the regional rec study, too. We went out and took a look at how some of our neighbors do that. And there's there's not a good apples to oranges comparison. Uh, but we've, we came at, the, at this particular challenge three or four different ways. Mr. Coyne? Well, after this discussion, do you now have a very clear idea of a, joy, of, of a unanimity, a, a unanimity among our opinions? I don't think so. Okay, <laughs> um, I would like to respond to a couple of points. Um, I was hoping that in bringing this up, that the other six members would just say, "Oh, that's great. Let's say vote on Mike's great idea," and that's obviously not happening. But I think, and, and this is, as you know, an annual discussion that, you know, is just all over the place. But this thing that Carl has done is a start, okay? And I'd like, I like uh, Commissioner Reynolds' comment that it's maybe not fair to just start, okay, you know, starting October 1st, there's going to be a $140 recreation fee. I think phasing something like that in uh, over a three-year period or something might be a good idea. Uh, this is a start. <clears throat> I think... Uh, I'm disappointed that there aren't four votes to say let's do that right now, but that's the way it is. But and then we'll meet next year and have this same discussion. But uh, you know, the bottom line is it's wonderful. We're, you know, we're helping youth and blah blah blah. But the, <laughs> we're here to balance the budget. I mean, that's our job, and that that's. That, I mean, that sounds kind of harsh, but that is what my job is and what their job is is to to do this so we don't have to make cuts. And obviously this year we're facing some significant cuts. And $10,000 isn't a great significant thing, but I think I'd like to, not right now, but I'd like to know uh, in the future an estimate so we can, during this next year, figure out what $140 for non-residents to pay a residential use fee, excluding picnic tables and walking in the park. Etc. Uh, but using facilities, how much that would raise, okay? And I think it would be substantial, but I I don't know. And I would hope we would uh, during the next year look at it uh, and hopefully use this as an ex kind of a stepping stone to do it, and then the eventual stepping stone of rec authority. Commissioner Cambensi and Commissioner Stonehouse. Um, well, I guess let me kind of ask Mike, um, your your proposal would be to implement a $140 rec fee to a non-resident, where Commissioner Reynolds thought perhaps it should be phased in. I mean, is there is there something that could be done where, um, you know, we can kind of look at 
I don't know if we have the numbers of residents and non-residents. I don't know if that's something we could gather. Um, but if we actually 42%. got... 42%. Yeah, we, we, we have an approximate number. It's like 42%. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. One, one is, just in terms of our athletic facilities. I, I assume that's what we're speaking to. Right. And could we look at something where it was, you know, something that's proposed as a four-year, five-year, however many year implementation to where we can actually either, one, get some, get their attention, get some change, two, raise money, but three, come to a rec authority agreement because I really think that's the answer. And I would be very supportive of something like that. So just throw that out there. Mr. Stonehouse and the city manager. Um, I think two things are evident here. And one is that this is a very good first step. And we might argue if it's a big enough step or it's too big. But I think it's a good first step. And I would hope that it would be the first step of many. So that when we, when we, when the commission next year meets, it's a case of, of re-looking at the next step. Because this is this is critical. This is a good first step. And the other item that potentially can come out of it certainly is the idea, the concept of energizing the idea of a rec authority, which I think is the ultimate goal for everybody. And if this will help us move in that direction, I think it's, it's something well done. Uh, whether we come to a, a complete reimbursement or we come to something short of that um, is an issue for you know future commissions to deal with. But I'm I'm very satisfied with uh, with what's been presented. Thank you. Uh, City Manager and then Commissioner Ryan. Yep. Thank you, Your Honor. I was only going to mention that uh, with the new technology we have for the reservation mm -hmm. system, we'll have the ability to generate those numbers. Uh, so the suggestion's been made, you know, as through the course of the year, we'll be, we'll be evaluating potentially uh, what a non-resident fee might be. We'll be able also, during that time, collect up the data we need. Uh, to take a look at how those numbers actually break out for usage. Uh, and we should have it with a substantial level of specificity for the type of activity, the type of facility. Commissioner Ryan? Yeah, I'm mostly pleased that when this comes up next year, I won't be here. Um, <laughs> because I, this, is, this is a philosophical issue, and obviously people feel strongly about it, and I have a different feeling. First of all, you know, this, this number of $140 I think is unfair. Um, you know, we've thrown everything in there but the kitchen sink to come up with that number. And for us now to, you know, penalize the soccer league for the fact that the city of Marquette bought the Hartwood Forest at some time in the past, I mean, just, it doesn't, it doesn't sit well with me. You know, because that's what you're talking about when you get to this $140 figure. We're talking about every penny the city spends, including, you know, the Hartwood Forest and, and uh, everything else we do and, and you know, to say that some little kid playing soccer is going to be penalized by that, I just think is wrong. So that's 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 it. You know, I guess, and I did a quick calculation a few minutes ago. You know, when I was looking at the the Parks and Rec budget for the Recreation Authority, I came up with we need 1.2 million dollars local share, non non fee, non whatever, and that comes out to 57 dollars a person. But uh, so yeah, 140 dollars is the total Parks and Recreation. Uh, uh, endeavor divided by the, the residents of the city, but uh, I think you know I think we need to we need to move in that direction. And uh, like I said, my my ideal my ideal uh, uh, scenario is is a parks and recreation authority. And I think like you know Commissioner Ken Benzi says, we need to encourage people to do that. And one one thing that uh, I, I neglected to mention, I, I like the idea of Commissioner Ken Benzi, you know, giving people the information of the, the, the full cost of our program. So when a, when a kid, when a kid uh, registers for junior hockey, his parents know that it's really costing us uh, $776 an hour to, for ice, or that's just a number I pull out of the, I think that's for ball fields, actually. Um, <laughs> uh, ice is probably even more expensive. Uh, yeah, but I mean, yeah, but I mean, th things, you know, they, they need to know that, and, and uh, you know, they, they know their, and, you know, I'm sure they, they realize that they're, you know, they're, they're playing at a facility that all the re city residents are, are subsidizing, but uh, if they knew exactly what the car cost would, maybe, it, maybe a groundswell would come up and say, well, you know, hey, county board, we want you to sit down with the city of Marquette and, and create a recreation authority. We're willing to throw in a mill to, to do so. 
Just, just to make it clear, I, 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 I support the idea yeah. of a recreation authority. You know, I, I just, I just don't want us to hold some kids hostage for us to get there. And, and but I, I think you know, in a perfect world, that's what we'd have. You need to hold the grandparents hostage. Yeah, yeah. Except they're not the ones that. Are <laughs> except they're be not going to play hockey. They're going you know, to be at the picnic table. But the issue is, <laughs> we, you know, we went forward and, and tried to do that, and and we did not get that response from the other, from the other townships. But yes, I agree, it would be a great idea. But. Uh, Anyway, anything further, or do we? Can we? Oh, Commissioner Benzi. Just real quick, um, I just want to thank Carl for your hard work. I mean, this—I can only imagine the amount of time this took, and for administration to really think creatively. I mean, it's a hard read, probably, on on, on what each of us wanted or what we see. But I just do want to say thank you, um, and I do want to say if a rec authority can come together. I think it's something that each community and each household, each person is willing to subsidize. I mean, there's an importance in it, just like education. Um, but if I can relate it to our retirement system, um, what happened there was we didn't plan for it. And some planned, I should say, but many didn't. Um, and it's basically, it's, it's not self-funded probably will never be where we've dug ourselves a hole so deep that if you look at the teaching profession many of the retired teachers and those at the very top never paid into it those in the middle they're starting to pay I'm at the very end before it got cut off and now for those starting in the teaching profession there is no pension there's a 403b and if you're willing to put away about 15,000 a year for your first 10 years you'll be where the pension is. So what I don't want to see happen with recreation is that we get to the point where we ignore it so long that we can't afford the facilities, we can't afford to fix them, and that we don't, we don't support it. We can't support it publicly. Um, and I guess it, this is extremely hard, especially when you look at a lot of the users. They are youth, um, but we got to start somewhere, and that's where I feel like we're on the path, um, and hopefully this will will wake up our neighbors and and get them to join us in, in paying for this and finding out finding ways to make it so it's it's self sufficient or it's at least coming to a fair playing field. So, thank you. Your manager, no. yes, okay. which, which I, one first? <laughs> well, I, I just want to follow up. We've only done this, uh, you know, one day. And le yesterday, those things aren't up for cut. No one was arguing, gee, I think we can do without a police department, or well, I think we don't need a fire department, okay? But this is where it gets sticky, because this is where the cuts are going to come. Because we can get along without a soccer field. We can't get along without a fire department. That's, you know, 34% of our budget goes to police and fire and safety. This is where the cuts are going to make all the more reason that we need to be very responsible to make sure that at least our neighbors pay, because we're going to not be able to do it. Yeah. Andrew, only just as a checkpoint, sir. I, uh, with, without asking for a vote, we're going to at this point take the mood of the commission uh, to be that we'll submit this as we've proposed, and we'll see upon final consideration if it's adopted or not but uh, we appreciate the we appreciate the robust discussion it is something that we're we're glad that the commission is starting to focus on it's a very challenging position for the administration to be in uh, there's a big dichotomy between arguing for being cost neutral and um, and accepting how much how much cost uh, to absorb and that's fundamentally a community question that's fundamentally a policy issue. We're ill-equipped to advocate for anything. But at this point, we've heard all the views of the commission, and we've not heard anything that would suggest an alternative at this point or something that we would uh, we would uh, propose in lieu. We did take notes. We will be uh, tracking back specifically answers on uh, marginal costs of ice, on potentially looking at what the uh, usage numbers are to see if we can differentiate by the different activities, who's actually using them, uh, and also 
providing some kind of an estimate from that experience on what a uh, top line annual non-resident uh, equivalent use fee might look like. And then hopefully next year when we come back and have this discussion again, we'll be able to do it with that that uh, better view. Mr. Klein. I would respond, thank you. But I disagree with one point, and that is uh, we need to do it before a year from now. We need to have a couple work sessions, at least this is my opinion anyway, before we sit down and have this our discussion, uh, we need to come with giving you guidance and an agreement of the commission where they what they want to do. So it's not, you know, arguing with Carl that isn't enough. Uh, it's w we need to give him and us an opportunity to discuss this and have a meeting and vote on it before the budget hearings. Otherwise, it's just year after year after year with no movement on that. This is the first movement we've had. It's a good step, but I think we need to do it during the year. Now, that's just me. Maybe other people, they could shake their head or go no or yes or whatever. But I think that needs to be done. I, I'd agree with that. I think, the, you know, to... I won't be here next year to discuss this, so I'd like to discuss it further this year. Um, and I think you and uh, it, it, the process moves much too slow if we have this this robust discussion this year and we, we continue on next year. I think uh, we, we do need to follow that up. And But it is fun to beat up on Carl each year. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. We're, we're not beyond the first <laughs> item yet. I know. <laughs> Well, right, we're not going to have the discussion. We're not going to come up to, with the answers now, but maybe what we need to do is set aside a, a work session specifically to discuss costs of, of parks and recreation and, and what are we going to do to to recover more of the costs? What are we going to do to encourage our neighbors to, to come together as a community and, and have one large recreation system that we all support? I don't know. Mr. Cambesi? Just a question. Um, I mean, we can change fees at any time, correct? We don't have sure. to do it at budget session. When, I'm thinking of, in, you know, now our budget session is August, which is probably a good time, but should we come to a conclusion earlier after work sessions, um, when would be a good time between seasons? Um, I guess from your standpoint, what kind of timing do you need? Because, uh, you know, we can't, we do it in December, you're, you're, <coughs> That's too late. Uh, you know what is? What are some of the practicalities that you deal with? Well, it depends upon the, the facility, of course. You know, our summer facilities that could be done sometime. You know, during the winter. Obviously, we want to give the user groups enough time to plan for that, to be able to educate. And that was one of the things I was going to bring out is, is we did discuss whether it should be one fee for all or what I would call almost an a la carte type fee schedule where depending upon the service that you're, that you're being provided, you pay a participation fee. So we had those discussions and we thought, you know, t as a start <laughs> to get something in the books, it was important for us to just start somewhere. And so that's what you see tonight. Um, you know, if the commission were to approve this budget, our next plan of action was really is education and outreach. Um, so we need to get out. We need to educate our user groups as to what this means and how they will be impacted by it. Depending upon who they are, they will be impacted differently. Um, junior hockey, obviously, um, we are a month, month and a half out um, from them being on the ice. Uh, we better be pretty quick with them if we, in fact, want to implement this fee schedule this year. Um, baseball, um, soccer, that can be put off, um, you know, a little bit later, but we certainly want to be as, you know, keep the ball in front of us, so to speak, um, uh, <laughs> um, just because they're going to be very interested, and we want to make sure that um, uh, that you know we can come to some conclusions and get them the information so that they can start doing their planning as well. Uh, the other groups, like the ones that are using our facilities, like a Barriga Gym, we're not ex we're not suggesting any big increases with that, and so um, that's not one that will be impacted. So it depends on the user group. Maybe what we need to do is perhaps go with this system, and in the very near future, discuss how we're 
what the future might hold and yep. because it's it's going to put you in a bind and it's going to it's going to get people it's going to put people in a bind to to start telling junior hockey well we, we don't really know what your rates are but you have to tell your participants you know so commissioner or mayor pro tem stonehouse i was like to comment this yeah. is a game changer you know we have danced around this as long as i've been on yep. the commission and well before and I think if, by, if assuming we, we pass this budget as presented, this is a game changer. This will allow change to occur from it in future commissions. And all that change will be very positive. Yep. As we get smarter at it, we focus on it better, we, we alter it a little bit, we cramp it up a little bit, it's a good thing. And we need to keep focus on that, that this may not be the victory that all of us want, but it is certainly a major step in that direction and allows future commissions now that the heavy lifting is done to be able to move away from it. So thank you. Yeah. Well, shall we proceed? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think last time I was in three hours and 45 minutes and had the record, and I think I'm going <laughs> to probably be close. Um, so uh, the we're going to start with a 101-290 promotional fund, page 72. Um, just some of you may not have been in a part of the commission when this uh, ordinance was adopted. This is a, in the uh, Chapter 201, Public Relations in the City Code, and this is for providing fee relief, in-kind service relief, uh, and or cash. Um, the way this, uh, this works is uh, that the our, our department uh, solicits uh, applications from service providers throughout the community that would be seeking some type of uh, fee relief. They provide an application that, that includes a description of what they intend to do and what they and how it, it meets the ordinance. Um, this year we requested we started the requests in January 1. Um, it was uh, deadline was March 31st. We went through them, and what you have in front of you tonight is uh, what we're suggesting. In terms of on page 72, these this is uh, the on the revenue page, which you see it's a negative revenue, and that's because those are uh, fee and or in kind relief. Those would be revenues that the city would receive if in fact they were charged uh, to those groups. We try to put as many notes underneath there to give the commission a sense of who's requesting and how much um, those requests are. Um, really it was pretty similar to what you saw the previous 12 months and so it's pretty it's pretty um, similar similar budget. You know, one note that would be helpful yep. is when you list all these things like in under 14, under 15, if you list them in the same order so that we could compare oh. what was 14, what was 15. Uh, I realize that sometimes you have, you know, different ones in there, but the ones that are, are repeat, if you could put them so that we can, you know, a person compare, because I was looking through the list and trying to see, well, what is the ball drop this year? What's the ball drop next year? Sure. Be real we helpful. can do that, yeah. certainly. And then at the end, you'd put what, whatever new ones came on online. Okay. Yeah. Yep, we can do that. Um, page 73 would be the cash disbursements and this year we're uh, suggesting $10,000 to the beautification committee, city band 5000 and open house 1200 Why are we cutting the band 2000 Well they had received 1750 halfway through the season. And the beautification committee received 2500 Yep, yeah, but they are also looking to do a project on the west end and that's how we justified giving them the full 10000 project is um, actually at the, the gateway end of the city by the viaduct by Holiday Inn. They're looking to um, put irrigation in out there um, as well as doing some landscaping to that um, um, signage, the gateway signage. Mm -hmm. And so a big part of this is not just the Petunia Panamonium but also a capital project on, on the west end. So they only real, really need 8,000 or 7,500. They don't really need 10,000 this year? Well, the that's why we're suggesting 10,000. That's why we're suggesting the full 10,000. But 10, we gave them 10,000 last year. They didn't do a new project. Um, actually, they, they, <coughs> they were uh, working with the uh, Father Marquette statue. Um, and I 
think they also did some some additional work. They laid in the irrigation system at the roundabout. Any other commissioners? Any other questions? Commissioner Cambesi? Um, just that I have heard a lot from the community residents. Um, you know, the city band has, has gone backwards where others have gone forward. Um, I think it's it's getting a lot of attention. Um, you know, I've said all along that I, I do have some difficulty with this only in that um, it's very subjective. And, and I understand that it's very expensive to put on a, on a lot of these things. I understand that they do a lot for our city. Um, however, I feel that there is extreme subjectivity that can be applied and certainly even if it's not applied it can have the public perception it's applied and I think um, you know right now I I guess I, I am hearing that members are feeling that or maybe they don't quite understand um, you know if they're actually a city band that has been around for a long time why they're getting less so I I guess I want to throw that out there as caution. I want to reiterate my feeling um, that, you know, when we're in a dire time and we're cutting two million from our capital budget, which means less roads, less streets, less sewers, um, we're not cutting at all here. And we're not asking these groups to go out and get sponsors, or we're not asking them to do fundraising on their own. And so, um, I just want to point out that these are all wonderful things. I'm glad we can help out. However, um, I was expecting this year to see see this go down as we hit these dire financial times. So um, I just want to throw that out there. I would point out, I can't speak for the city band, I, I don't know, but I can point out that the, the uh, Beautification Committee does a terrific amount of fundraising and that the relatively small amount of money we provide is exactly that, seed money, more so than it is actual money that that's not their budget. It's much, much larger because they've gone out and found the money. So I would I would certainly want that to be recognized. Uh, but again, I, I can't speak to the city band. I, I don't know enough about it. Beyond to say that I think they do a terrific job representing the city in, in many, many ways. If you were, had a chance to go to the band concert this weekend at the island, I'm told there were over 800 people there. And it was a, a very startling event. So I certainly can support that. Commissioner Coyne. Uh, just a comment. Uh, a couple of city managers ago, uh, the city manager just cut everything, said there will be no, we will not pay anybody for any community activities, period. And talk about buying $41,000 of ill will. That was. A superb investment on that individual's part. I mean, every one of these people was just thoroughly annoyed at the city. I think Sarah has a good point. Uh, we've asked everybody to cut 10% off their budget uh, and to not say we're going to give you 10% less because of the problems we're facing wouldn't be an unreasonable thing to do. Uh, I think it would be prudent, but it's st it makes them understand that we still very much support them. But uh, to not do this would be a huge error, I think, huge. Yeah, I guess I, if you want to cut the city band, you know, 28 percent, then we ought to cut all all things 28 percent. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm not saying that we should cut any of it. I was surprised to see, you know, the few cuts that we had in this area. Yeah. If we had any cuts other than the city band, city manager. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I guess on, on this one, we would like a clear sense of the commission, um, <laughs> because what we 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 agree. This was one of those discussions we were speaking to yesterday: the short-term trades versus the long-term value. Uh, cutting off your nose to spite your face. Thankfully, I wasn't that city manager, and I I. <laughs> pledge to the community I'm not going to be that city manager. Uh, you can't live as Spartan in a draconian existence uh, that cutting all of these things would result in. Uh, people have heard me say it many times. Most of the things that people love about Marquette from a programming standpoint, the city never touches. There are groups of volunteers who feel very passionately about what they do. 
They love putting these programs on. They attract a lot of people to our community. They provide great value, very similar to, to what Commissioner Reynolds uh, mentioned a while ago. Uh, they spend their time here not just doing these things, but enjoying everything else we have to offer. And so we think it's a good investment to keep doing that. Uh, we tried to hold it from a financial standpoint as a status quo item. So you'll see there's not much difference between what we did last year and what we're proposing to do this year. Uh, if the commission would like us to cut 10% kind of as a top line across the board, uh, of course we'll do that. But we'd like to hear it specifically from the commission. Well, I don't want to see us cut 10%. I'd first see just restore the city band. <laughs> That's the mayor's favorite. Uh, <laughs> it's one of them. <laughs> I, no. I'd be happier if I saw him one day on the 4th of July parade, but... Uh, well, I'd love to see you have to go down the food fest, I guess. Commissioner yeah. sure. Benzik. Well, as a member of the beautification committee, um, <laughs> um, I would be in support of cutting 10% only to say we're doing this to our departments. Um, you know, and, and hopefully, you know, letting these groups know it's not that we don't support you, but this is our across the board goal for this year as things don't look good. We're still supporting them, but we're also realizing that we have to cover our costs. And, you know, when you look at what we're really here to do um, as a city, I mean, they're very basic things and they're things that taxpayers expect. Um, as a member of the beautification committee, I'd be more than happy to f pitch in to help make up the cut as a private citizen supporting that group, being a member of that group. And I hope that the supporting members, should the commission choose to take the 10% cut approach, would do the same. But I, I feel in all fairness, um, you know, I guess if I had to cut my budget 10% at the school and the school was still kind of giving out charity, and I don't want to say it's charity, it's, they're wonderful things, but I do think we should hold the standard to everything if we're going to do 10% across the board and not exclude anything. So I, I would be in support of that. I am not in support of 10% cut. <laughs> I would point I'm out support of moving forward. I'm in, I'm in favor of what we got. Just, you know, just, this is their recommendation. I am also a member of the Beautification Committee, <laughs> believe it or not. And, I'm, uh, and, and knowing the full value that they, they give the community, I'm, I'm very much supportive of what staff recommends. Commissioner Campana? I'm not a member of any of these, but I just appreciate what they do. <laughs> um, the amounts to me are so, you know, I hate to say small, but they're not, it's $10,000. In the scheme of things, it's not a lot. It's a lot of money, but I think we should keep it where it is. They add value to the city. I, I just my my feeling is that we should not cut it. I, I hate to say that that yeah, other areas should be cut, but uh, this because it's such a small amount, we should keep it. Thank you. Commissioner sure Reynolds, just so you can get your mood of the commission. Um, I think what you suggested is fine. Um, if we were to restore the city band back to 2000 and we did a 10% cut all around, it would be $680 we'd be saving. So what you suggested is perfectly acceptable, and I appreciate all these groups and what they do. City manager. Pardon? Okay. <laughs> Should we move forward? All right, Please. the uh, next budget is uh, 101751, pages uh, 98 to 101. Um, this is the community services admin budget as well as the uh, community services athletic field maintenance budget. Um, the uh, some of the larger changes that you'll see this year, uh, just kind of looking at the fact sheets, is uh, the community services director position was 50% community services last year, 50% in the city manager's budget this year. It's 100% community services, and so you'll see how we've shifted those dollars back into community services. In addition to that, 
We've got state mandated um, minimum wage increases, and uh, that also resulted in some increases in wages. Um, just some highlights from this uh, division. Um, we increased that we had 55 special events, which is a 10% increase from last year. Uh, we implemented new software, which we're configuring, and this is for all of our facilities, which would be for our uh, reservation POS system. We probably put over 300 hours of staff time in the configuration of it. We think it uh, uh, will be extremely user-friendly for our um, customer base. As the city manager has indicated, we should be able to get uh, good reports in terms of resident, non-resident, and uh, trending. So the other thing is we are 100% successful with our grants, over $2 million worth of grants last year. And uh, we were involved in the Recreation Authority uh, uh, Master Plan. Um, page 100, um, that's the Parks and Rec Athletic Field Maintenance. Um, same staff, we're not asking for any additional staff. Uh, this is uh, for the maintenance for um, really our infield maintenance for the, uh, the nine um, ball fields, uh, baseball fields. And uh, we provided you with some of the program statistics on the bottom of that page. Page 101 is the actual expenditures uh, page. And um, once again, on um, line 702, you'll see a slight increase, and that's the majority of that is just shifting uh, uh, community services director position over to be 100 percent part of community services. We split it out amongst the divisions, but uh, that's a part of it. And then the uh, mandated state uh, minimum wage. Um, other than that, you see uh, the shared technology fee, 813, that's increased somewhat, and then I believe the uh, Dan Fredrickson, Mr. Fredrickson explained sort of the cost accounting behind how that all sort of, uh, how they're, they're uh, costing out all of those services yesterday. So that's uh, the, uh, what you see there. Other than that, all of the fees or the, um, all the line items are pretty much in order of what they were last year. So I can answer any questions with the, uh, 101751 budget. The wages ball field that's up in the the top salaries and wages or no that starts at uh, at the very bottom. Uh, it's not the very bottom. It's it's with the extra five digits on, on the um, if you can see that oh. there's a seven five one zero zero at the uh, end of. Oh, I see. Okay, item. okay. That's where just that below starts. that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I see. Yeah. I guess I, I was just enamored by the going from 20-some 20, 20 thousand to zero <laughs> and didn't look any further. So I have a question. Yes, I'm sorry. Is that page 101, is that more than is athletic field maintenance? I'm sorry? Page 101. Yes. That's what? What's all included in that? Oh, the services that we provide, we oversee, um, and it's sort of explained in the, in the front of the, we're sp responsible for all the planning, development, management, operation of all the parks, recreation facilities, as well as um, we work with all of the program, uh, the user groups that utilize our facilities. Um, we do all the grant writing, um, grant administration. Um, we work with uh, and oversee some of the uh, finances for arts and culture as well as the senior services. Um, and we provide all the communication to our public. Mr. Coyne? Oh, I have a question. What, what is the senior pavilion? Where is that? Senior pavilion is at Presque Isle, and it's uh, adjacent to the, uh, the Moosewood Nature Center. There's a pavilion that's right between the, the, the Moosewood and the... Next to the ice the, cream um, store? Yeah, but no, it's actually further towards yeah. the community mm. garden. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's in between the Moosewood and the community garden. Okay, thanks. I saw it a few weeks ago for the first time in my life. <laughs> I haven't even heard of it. <laughs> it's there. <laughs> it's there. It's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. Any additional questions with 101751? Then we'll we go... Talk, just, uh, we were talking about... You said ball fields was 167,000. Correct. Okay, that's in this 354,000, or or is there 
There's parts that is in all like public works or some other yep. budgets. Okay. Yep. Good question. Okay. Um, that is just the infield maintenance. So just um, anything that would be uh, the outfield um, and um, fencing, anything Bring, anything beyond the, the, the infield yeah. would be additional to this. Okay. So the and that's in uh, 101441, which is uh, DPW Parks okay. Division. We're moving on to the next. Uh, the next fund is uh, 101-800, which is arts and culture. Um, we're not suggesting any increases in terms of staffing. It is, I'm sorry, page 105 to 107. There's no increase to staffing. We've got. Uh, 80% of the um, the arts and culture manager in this in this uh, division. Uh, we do include 5% of the community services admin assistant. They do all the uh, financial reconciliation as well as um, uh, do payroll. The uh, one part-time uh, administrative assistant, and then three part-time um, clerical aides, and um, and they provide for curating and and uh, support for the division. Um, some of the big, uh, I think, points this year is certainly the master plan, the arts and culture master plan, which we're working on that. Um, one of the, the focuses we will have this year is certainly grants. Uh, we just hosted the uh, Michigan Council for Arts and Culture Affairs uh, seminar, and uh, then we have lots of opportunity to work with both nonprofits um, in, um, in trying to bring dollars into the city as well as to incorporate this division into those, into those grants. And so we've got a good strategy for that, and I think uh, we can be successful. If we go to, to 107, uh, that's the actual, um, the actual budget itself. Um, under the, the changes or anything that, that I would say that I kind of highlighted here, is uh, certainly the um, we looked at salary and wages was a slight increase and that was step increases and then the state mandatory minimum wage um, under health care insurance which is 717 um, we I'd make the point that we do have a retiree that's included with that and so we do cover those costs um, other than that it's uh, under special events we you see 17,500 um, we intend to work uh, with, uh, uh, we tend to write a grant, and if you look on the revenue side, we're anticipating a $17,000 grant through the Michigan Council for Arts and Culture Fair, which will cover a lot of these programming uh, type special events, which will offset that. Um, and so we're doing everything we can to maximize uh, grant dollars for operations. Unfortunately, uh, the Michigan Council for Arts and, Culture, Arts and Culture Affairs don't allow us to use um, the program, programming grants for operations, and so we try to maximize them for um, providing services to the community. Any questions? Commissioners? Commissioner Kambenzi? I know there's a because I can't go after this grant, so I'm very envious of it, but there's, I think it's up to $100,000 this year. It's an actual MCACA uh, capital improvement yep. grant. Um, is that in, I don't see it in this budget, but hopefully Parks and Rec might be looking well, at it. Or? It's on our radar screen. Um, okay. One of the things that we thought about is uh, park benches for uh, the band shell. It's going to be a large purchase, and so we're looking at that as a major purchase. Um, and uh, anything that uh, we also looked at, we needed to get some work done at the band shell with in terms of uh, lighting, and so mm -hmm. that might be another one that we're looking at. Staging might be mm -hmm. another one, and so we've we've left that meeting and we've got a laundry list of things that we are going to to maximize those grants, and those are great grant dollars, mm -hmm. you know. So. Yeah, they're annual, so every year you can, <laughs> can apply for it. Um, the only other question I have, with the special events, should we not get the grant um, 
Are you expecting the commission to fully fund the events? Well, I would say last year we were, we were successful with 17,000, and I, I would anticipate that in everything that we've heard is that um, we will be eligible for that 17,000. And if it is less, then we will have to look at it at that point and try to prioritize. Or we are, you know, we will prioritize. So last year we approved, um, I think it was 5,000 for the, maybe it was a little more, the Thursday concert series, but this year it will be a grant? The dollars that we get from the MCA CA will be used to fund these activities, and that's what everything okay. will be in that special event. Okay. I guess I'm happy to hear that that it's coming from a grant, um, even though it's it's used by the state of Michigan taxpayers. Um, I think it's a better a better case than just asking for the money from our taxpayers. So I just to like thank thank you and Tina for that. I think it's a good it's a win win. You know, Pro Tem Stonehouse. Carl, there's also a National Maritime Grant program that closes out on September 23rd. Uh, again, federal program, and that one would be very applicable for any interpretive signage along the harbor, uh, especially since Matson Park is so prevalent, as well as the city owning the waterfront. Uh, I would encourage you to think about that as being a real possibility. It's something that we desperately need when we compare ourselves to other port communities. We have virtually no interpretive signage that talks to our history or even wayfinding signage that is specifically driven to the water or the harbor. I can forward you the details on that. Thank you. I do have one more question if I could ask. Um, I do know that the state grants the window is January, uh, January through September 30th. Um, so the Halloween spectacle. And the only downside to those grants are there are three months where you can't use the funding for events. So the Halloween spectacle for 5,000 does fall into that as well as a few of the concerts. Let me answer that. I mean, right, the, I mean, in many, you know, I think it would be sort of a reimbursement uh, to the fund. Um, so it would be something that, and, and this happens, I think, in some cases with, in terms of the cash flow. Um, but it would be anticipating that that the funds that are received from the grant would be appropriated once once they are received. Um, and do you want to you want to voice? I, I I also have Tina here, Tina Harris, and um, so we can also you know, we're, we're applying for these. Uh, these you need to be on the microphone. Why don't you grab a chair? When we're applying for these grant monies with this program grants, not just that 17000 that's for programs, I mean, part of that is um, our salaries are included in writing for those grants. You know, so actually, it's, um, there are 50-50 grants, so we have to provide 50% of it, and we do, we do so with salaries and everything. Um, my, we got money for programming last year, and although they say the programs have to take place during this time, there's a lot of planning for those programs, and my feeling is that they looked at our programs in general, and they were really impressed with what the city had to offer um, and how many people that we served, and we basically gave them our entire programs, from our workshops to everything. So we'll be including, I guess what I'm saying, more programs than what's listed right there. We have workshops, we offer exhibits, and that's in other line items as well. So, um, you know, we're looking at our all-around programming that we do, which is much broader than just the, the four main kind of featured programs, maybe, if, if that makes sense. Okay, just, I guess, just for the record, then I, I'm, I'm not in favor of using, you know, tax dollars for the Thursday concert series. I was against this last year. I really, um, you know, this was something that I feel was a slippery slope where, you know, we were approached to fund this uh, once free concert series, but it really, I think, turned pretty ugly in terms of, um, one, we got people to then apply for it, but two, um, there was some dissatisfaction about the caliber of people who applied, and um, 
I just don't think it's in our best interest to use tax dollars to, to support paying artists for Thursday concert series. Um, the only other thing I would caution is that um, you know, the Halloween spectacle, $5,000 for an event is a lot of money. And again, these are tax dollars where um, you know, we cut $5,000 out of a budget that might be you know, holsters for the chief of police to have you know, lights on top of you know, the handguns um, that will last years. Um, where now they have to hold flashlights on top of it. And I know that's, you know, these are things that they might seem small, but these are the type of decisions we're making. And, um, you know, again, I guess if this is one of those events we're supporting with, with tax dollars, um, it's a lot of money for one event to just go out there and ask for. Um, and hopefully there will be some other grants out there, but um, I just want, for the record, um, I wouldn't be in support of, of tax dollars uh, beyond, you know, the programming, um, I guess, your time for that, using it to help plan it. Um, you know, but certainly paying artists, I think this is a slippery slope. So I just want to get that on the record. And also, um, you know, certainly to, to make sure we're following the protocol of those state grants because they are very specific. Thank you. The Thursday concert series, you have 500 budget. Wasn't 5,000 last year? 5,500. Yeah. So, so you must know, have a. a we didn't use it all. must be just a little bit. Uh, is that a carryover from last year then? Or, or right, we didn't use it all last year. I mean, we we're. carry over here instead of grabbing it? Can you carry? I don't think you can carry over <laughs> city budgets. <gone>. Pardon? <laughs> yeah. But it's, it doesn't seem like you can do much in Thursday concerts this year versus what you did last year. If you had 5,000 budgets last year and you're budgeting 500 this year? No, that's, if, if you look at it, it's 500 per concert. Oh, okay. I see. Okay. So it's no different. Yes. I guess, I guess what I wanted to say was the um, – the master plan, really following it. One of the things that it suggested that the city does take on, and it could shift, but that the community really likes when we do some signature events. For example, the annual holiday art sale, which is one, um, and they have a impact that's kind of reverberation. I was just in Big Bay, and a new family that is here um, um, because of the mine was talking about. I heard, overheard them at the Perkins Park talking about this Halloween spectacle, and they can't wait to do all these things in Marquette. And it was a really cool thing, and um, so it's one day, but there's a lot of preparation for it within the community, making it happen. And and I'm very aware of the um, need for getting in revenue and the grants, and I feel like we will be positioning ourselves in a place to to find funds to pay for these types of programs. I wholeheartedly agree with you and I think that we're going in that direction. Any other comments? Measures? Sure. Long? Sure. Thank you. No. Yeah. Excuse. The, uh, the next budget that we'll be looking at is uh, Fund 290 Senior Services, pages uh, 140 to 143. Two nine zero six eight five is the in-home service budget. Uh, this is for providing homemaking services to homebound seniors. Um, it is supported by an upcap contract, which is a um, purchase for service contract. Uh, in this budget, we have the senior center coordinator, social work coordinator, two social workers, one uh, center aid, and seven homemakers. Um, and I would point out that it's portions or percentage percentages of their um, their time. So we try to cost account this stuff out as much as we can. Um, page one four one is our really our, our large. Fund. This is the senior services allocation and local millage fund. This is the 290687. And this, this fund provides for information and referral, outreach, health screenings, education and financial management, 
case coordination, support, and homemaking services. Um, as I said, this is also a local millage that uh, provides additional services to um, strictly uh, citizens of uh, senior citizens that live within the city of Marquette. Um, we have, uh, we're not asking for any additional uh, support in terms of um, additional positions this year. Uh, they're all um, the same percentages that we had last year. So there's no change with that. Um, the one exception is certainly the community services director that was 50% of the managers. Now it's 100% community services. So it's 30% of 100% versus 30% of 50, if that makes sense. Um, page 142. Uh, one. Any questions on the fact sheets? Yeah, I have a question on the community service assistant director. What is that? That's or who is that? I guess that's uh, John Swenson. He spends 40% of his time at the senior center? He participates and, yep, he, he does a lot of the... of his time at the senior center, he participates. Well, he he spends quite a bit of his time at 40%. the senior center. He does all of the, I mean, he's participating in the interviews and he leads the interviews for um, homemaking positions. Um, there's a lot of work that our administrative staff provides as support. How do you calculate the 40 percent? You ask John how much do you want to charge the senior center, or, or do you actually keep? I think time we look at it and we try to, to get a good estimation. Just seems like it's it's a lot to, that he's providing to the senior center services, and I guess I don't see him doing that much. I don't see him doing anything for it, but but it just it 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 doesn't seem uh, reasonable to me. Okay. Pardon. Well, yeah, I guess it's to our advantage. It's a, what it is. This this thing has its own source of revenue, so we, we tap it all over the place. The Arts and Culture Center taps it for for nine ten thousand dollars, and that's not what the voters approved the millage for. The voters approved the millage for senior services, not to subsidize the Parks Administration or the or their Arts and Culture Center. Okay. Well, there are Do you disagree yeah. with that? No. Oh, okay. Well, One thing. You know, one thing I would say is that we do provide senior arts programming. I mean, that is a big. I understand one we of do. We do some, but uh, you know, you do a I, considerable amount. Yeah, um, but I, it, it seems like we're we're just milking a, a, a separate pot of revenue. And I don't agree necessarily agree with the the uh, uh, millage for senior services in the first place. I think the you know I don't I don't like budging by referendum, but uh, so. But I guess a, a question of if. We're really getting 40 percent of the of that person's time for senior services. Okay. I, yeah, Just one question: that we do service people, though, broader than the city of Marquette through this program. We do. Is that reflected? It, it's it's not, and then okay. you know the the. Um, the service areas is Powell Township, Marquette Township, Chocolate Township, and the City of Marquette for the allocation and the upcap contract. The local millage is strictly for local seniors. Okay. If there's no other questions, I will go to 142. 142 on the top of the page, we have. Um, we have the um, uh, revenues um, from uh, line item 402 down to 678 would be the local millage. Um, 543 would be our homemaking uh, contract. And then uh, 586 is our uh, county millage <coughs> contract. We can get 296000 this year from them? Correct. Oh. Um, any other questions with, if there are any questions, you know, if there aren't any, I'll go on to 685. That's our homemaking um, services. Th there's really no changes this year from last. But I can answer any questions that you may have. Yes. I'm sorry, Dave. 
Carl, one of the revenues is personal property tax. Yeah. That's a revenue. Is that the one that's going to be we voted out? We're not going to have that anymore? Fourteen thousand about. Oh, okay, the, the personal property tax. Yeah, that's part of the discussion that we had last night with Diane. Uh, when she, she's trying to uh, figure out how it's going to work. We think these numbers that we have for personal property tax are good, just like we said last night. But we aren't going to really know until we've gone through one cycle of everything of how it's all going to work out. So it's going to come from somewhere. We just don't know where. Don't know when, don't know where. That's kind of the <laughs> theme with it's personal property tax. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank oh, you. That's clear. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Is there any questions with the um, in-home services, which, which is the 685? If not, then we'll go to 687. Um, once again, the, the changes would be our part-time um, wages as well as the community services director being 100% in community services this year. Other than that, um, there's no real big changes in the budget from last year. Um, but I can answer any questions if you, if you have them. I do have one question, and it's it's more comparing, I guess, the up cap, and then the you know what we do within the senior service allocation and local millage. Um, with the up cap, are, we're going outside to these these homes, or correct? Okay. Um, do we get transportation for that, or is that? They provide their own transportation. We pay to the sa to the first client, and then we do not pay from the last client back to their home. Okay, and so then the transportation in our our is that what you're talking about? in the senior services allocation and local millage that transportation figure. Well, I think it's important to remember that that the six eight seven. I believe that's what you're referencing. The 687 yes. account? Yes. That also includes allocation from the county, so okay. it's not strictly local millage. Okay. Um, in the allocation from the county, we do include transportation. Okay, and that would be That's taking them to appointments or yep. stuff like that. Yep. Okay. There are some, there are some you know, in-home services in this account. Okay. One thing that we try to keep our... You know, we, we don't want to have anybody on the waiting list. That's one of our most critical services. Okay. Anyone else? Just, sorry, just to finish my comment, I, yep. I do know that there's a huge increase in the arts, senior arts programming, and I, um, you know, we do all the firing for their ceramic projects, and um, it's awesome to see and I know that there's a huge interest in that so um, I guess I, I think that's one of the positives is getting them involved in the arts and culture and and making sure that they're kind of commingling I think it's it's a positive thing so and I'd add to that I think there's a lot of synergy between the two um, it's tremendous synergy I mean it's it's you know when we talk about the new senior this is a, this is exactly what we're talking about and this is one of the steps that we've taken to integrate um, the new senior into our senior center. You know, it doesn't have to be at the center. It can be at alternative locations. It could be at Lakeview Arena. It can be at the, the um, Kaufman. It can be at, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Arts Center. And that's what we're trying to do is trying to expand that footprint, cast that net a little further. If there's no other questions. Next. We'll move on. The next one is uh, 508 Tourist Park, which is on pages 168 to 169. And this is, um, I would say this is a real success story. Um, this is uh, 
a seasonal facility. Uh, we're not, uh, which in includes just the campground. It's 110 campsites, um, which includes both full service and primitive sites, two washroom facilities, and a uh, office building. Um, the um, The, the thing that I would bring out from a, we're not suggesting any additional um, staff with this budget. The, um, this is a, an enterprise account, so this fund is one that uh, does maintain its own fund balance. Um, it has its own separate set of fees that support uh, its expenses. Um, some highlights this year, I would say, is that uh, we've had a, rank, a record single week. Um, if you've been watching the weekly and you see the charts, we've done just phenomenal. Um, we, this is the first year that we've actually had waiting lists to get into the park on some of the special event weekends to the point where we're looking at potentially temporary campground permits to expand into some of the grassy or the green space areas. Next year, um, I think a lot of it is, you know, we sell um, quality service. It's a clean place. It's a family place. It's close to the community. It's an urban camping experience that someone can camp and ride their bikes downtown and see the theater, get a, a bite to eat, and be back camping that evening and by a fire, and I think people really enjoy that. I think the lake has brought a lot of uh, excitement to the campground, and I think uh, uh, this facility will just continue to be a gem for us as we move forward. I'd also say it also does a lot of outreach, um, so we work with the CVB in getting packets, information that we try to give out to the um, those that visit our community as to what types of things are going on, how they can get downtown, how they can access trails. Um, so it's a great opportunity to have that in the trench, face-to-face -face with people that are being in our community. And we can control what we're providing them. Um, I'd also say that we had a great uh, Hiawatha weekend, and uh, that's always a, a challenge, and it's always a great challenge. It brings a lot of, of diversity to our community, and this year was uh, no different, and it was a, a, a fantastic year. Um, if you go to 169, there's the actual, actual budget. Um, the uh, revenues you see uh, a slight increase. Uh, the the big increase that you see there is the other revenues, which is the forty five thousand, which is uh, six nine five. That's the passport grant that the city submitted for the two pods um, on the restroom facilities. So we fully anticipate getting that, and we and put that in as a revenue. Um, so that shows uh, increases our um, our total revenue to 234,000. So you see you see a bump, but it's the 45,000, which is the grant. Um, in terms of the expenditures, uh, it's yep. On the revenues, they've got 170,000 for rentals. Yep. In 2013, they took in 194,000. Yep. If you divide the year-end estimate for 2014 by 1.25. That's two hundred twenty-nine thousand for twelve months. Yeah, I think I think we are conservative. We're conservative, conservative with our approach. <laughs> you know, I think I would it, hope so. One of the things that we see, and you know, we're always a little a little cautious in projecting revenue. Is is weather always plays a role? Um, so weather, meaning especially on the bookends of our season, mm -hmm. we're always a little concerned with that. And so we'd rather be conservative with our approach and make sure that we're budgeting accordingly. Okay. But it's obviously they, they really understate the revenues, I would think. You know, which it's our hope. If you, well, I would hope it is. Otherwise, we've got a real problem there. If we, yeah. in 2013, we took 194,000. If we only do 170,000 next year, we get some sort of a problem. Yeah. And, and uh, so I think the, but I guess whatever extra revenue comes in, it it, it stays in that fund for the. It for does. The I mean, even the tourist park. I, thank you. I mean, yeah. even I would say with being conservative, we still show a, a fund balance, you know, or, or a transfer into re to reserve with the budget that we're provided. Mm -hmm. So any additional revenues that we capture over the, the next fiscal year will just increase that fund balance, yeah. which is a good thing. Um, I don't really show too many changes. Um, the, the, the salary and wage increase is, is fully uh, the – um, state mandated minimum wage increase. So that's what you're seeing there. 
Um, the only other thing that we have in there is the capital improvement, which is 972, which is that um, that passport grant. It's, so it's uh, it's a sixty thousand dollar projected project. Mr. Coyne. Um, Carl, <clears throat> what is the last one where it says addition to reserves? What's that? that? That's the fund balance. That's Those are the dollars that are going into the reserve fund balance. Okay. Is this the first time this has ever been neutral revenue? We've actually done quite well. <laughs> if you look... Um, if you look across the years prior, you, those are the dollars that have been transferred into fund balance. Transferred? From? Yeah, it's not an actual transfer. It's ju it just means revenues have exceeded expenses in that particular year. So if you look across the history, uh, back in 2011, it was almost 17,000. 2012, 41,000, and 13, 60,000. And even though, uh, as the mayor pointed out, uh, the revenue is budgeted very conservatively, we're still looking at a $2,000 contribution, uh, not contribution, excuse me, a $2,000 addition to its uh, reserve. And if those revenues increase and the expenses stay the same, then that just means the reserve balance is going to increase higher. And it's just important to, to note that this is a self-sustaining budget, Tourist Park is, and we can use the reserves to help keep the uh, campground up and running without the use of general fund dollars, and that's the importance behind uh, the reserves for this. Um, what, I, I don't know. What are, how much are the reserves? We can get that. We can get that number to you. Do you think it's like ten dollars or two hundred thousand dollars, or do you have any clue? Like two hundred thousand, but I okay. Get you an exact number. Okay. And, and one of the things that I would say is some of the capital projects that need to go on out there was was in the um, tourist park land use plan, and so we'll be working towards those as we move forward to draw those funds down. Okay. Like Gary said this is a self-supportive fund and and so all the capital and projects are required to come from the okay. reserves good job thank you Commissioner Cambezzi. I'd Mr. also Hyde. like to say great job because it's who doesn't like it when it's a pretty much a balanced budget every year um, with the reserves helping out not the general fund so um, that's always great to see also I think the reserves are important to you know for grant matching dollars should we you know, have a year like this year where we can't really use a lot of our general fund dollars to get those those grant matches. So, I mean, this is it's a win-win. And on a positive note, um, you know, every year I don't know if my fellow commissioners pay it, but I've been paying the ten dollar passport fee. Um, when you renew your license, you can opt in or out of that. Eleven dollars this year. It's eleven dollars year. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of people have said, "Oh man, you know, why do I want to pay that? What do I get?" Well. Here's a great example of what our community got, um, $45,000. I'm assuming it's every year we can apply for these funds. Um, I did have a friend recently get a ticket out at Little Presque, and uh, I think it was a $25, $30 ticket, and I said, well, you should have paid the <laughs> $11. So at any rate, um, it's nice that you're going after and capturing that money. And so I just I want to thank you for that. Ryan. Yeah, I, I was going to say I appreciate your comments about the jewel because I think I made that same speech a few years ago that this is a, truly a unique urban camping experience. And more and more people are looking for this to do just as you said, camp out and then go downtown, you know, eat in a nice restaurant and then go and sit by the campfire. Um, but but our, our master plan and, you know, where, where do we stand on some of the, the grant I, grants we had talked about? And do we have do we have some out, some pending, some? Anticipated. Yeah, um, this year we opted not to pursue. Um, we were looking at one uh, on the day use side, which would be the um, restroom trailhead uh, support facility, um, and it was approximately, you know, a, a six hundred and fifty thousand dollar project, and and really it didn't fit uh, with some of the budget constraints that we had and so we had to prioritize that and um, so we, we've got it prepared and we'll move it forward when it makes sense with the budget with the rest of the things that are higher priority um, but we thought at the very least we could do the pods um, 
And so that's, you know, that became a priority. Um, as we move forward, uh, there are some changes that we have to do with our primitive campsites. There was some increase with uh, providing handicapped accessible campsites that are primitive. We'd like to make some of those changes next year. Um, we'd also like to make, uh, to incorporate that new playground, and so we need to do some, uh, some um, uh, landscaping, you know, foundation work that uh, would incorporate that, and that would be like, that we'd like to do some of that yet this fall, sort of at the end of the camping season. Um, and, and that was actually in the, the current budget, you know, that was paid for with uh, the grant and the dollars that were allocated for that. The, the playground. Yep. That's because that's, I was going to ask about. Yep. That's 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 actually in the current budget, and so um, that we've received the playground. It's actually we we opted not to do it with all the work that had to be done with the freeze ups, and um, there was just so much going on from a public works perspective that we just didn't think that we could do that. And so when we said, why don't we just wait <laughs> and, and wait to the fall? I think they exhaled a, a sigh of relief because they, <laughs> because it was probably a little more than what they could handle. And so we do have the playground equipment. It is in storage, and we'll be working to, to get it installed um, either this fall or early next spring. What kind of matches required for the grants? Um, tw usually it's 25 to 26 percent. So the six hundred thousand dollar grant, about one hundred fifty thousand, we'd have to come up but, with locally. Yeah, the problem with uh, with it's not a problem. It's it's the trust fund grants are three hundred thousand dollar maximum. Um, so you know we'd be looking at you know over three hundred thousand dollar local match, and that's 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 a lot of money. You know, especially when we're looking at all the other capital projects that had a higher priority. And so it's unfortunate, but you know the work that that's been done, it's it's not. You know, it's not in waste because we are fully, you know, prepared to move it forward when it does make sense, and um, and so uh, you know, it's in in also with the large match, you know, it will score very high, um, and so we're we're comfortable with that. And, and in the meantime, we're going to go after some smaller grants and continue to make you know small improvements and and try to prioritize those to make the the greatest gain, you know, for the dollars that we're spending. Notes. Nothing else? We done with um, the tourist park center? Did you want to go through expenses? I think I interrupted you. With the no, I think you know. I think they're 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 pretty standard, with the exception of, of the ones that I pointed out. And you know, I don't know if you have questions on what we're doing or how we're operating, or you know. But um, this is really a good story. As as Gary said, you know, we continue to put dollars into reserve even after doing a sixty thousand dollar capital imp improvement project. I you know, think you'll put a lot greater than 1925 this year. <laughs> what? Yeah, you know. Right, so, you, will. <laughs> you know, after having record weeks, like and, I said, it doesn't matter. You know, the the, yeah. the money's not frivoled away here. That uh, yeah. you know, whatever profit you make certainly will be plowed back into a a yeah. good park. So, so if there's no other questions, then we'll go on to marinas, um, and we'll start with uh, 594. And we start on page 188, and that's the Presque Isle Marina. Um, this, um, I think, this fund is is a challenge, uh, as you know, um, because of the uh, you know condition of the marina. We never quite know how many slips are going to be available on any given year when we when we go back in. And, it, um, and we've had several work sessions on specific to this marina, um, and so it's 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 always tricky. Um, but you know, to describe the first page, we're we're really not suggesting any addition in terms of staffing. Um, uh, I would tell you that uh, the slips, the seasonal slips that are available are uh, leased. Um, we've actually had, uh, I think, a very good summer. Um, we've had good transient numbers. We've had good fuel sales. Um, we've had good launch, you know, even though it was late. Um, I think it's been an, an excellent season thus far, and so I think we're, we're pretty happy with the way things are going, you know, this season. Um, we do have... Um, a grant 
for uh, the capital improvement of the boat launch, and that was uh, in last year's or this year's budget, so we anticipate a uh, spring project, um, and that would be doing the boat launch improvements. Um, the Harbor Advisory Committee is really rolling up their sleeves and working on, um, you know, what options, what, you know, alternatives and, you know, in terms of what's the next phase of that, uh, of that marina. I appreciate, the, you know, the folks coming out tonight and sharing their opinions. I think it's, there's a lot of emotion that's charged with it. There's a lot of attachment that's out there. There's, um, and so it's, it is somewhat, in, you know, emotionally charged discussion, but uh, it, it's a good discussion to have. It's really a good discussion. And, you know, one of the things that we continue to come back, and I think Commissioner Ryan brings it out often, is, you know, what is the carrying capacity of our waterfront? You know, how many slips do we need? What is, you know, and, and what, is that, what is that number? And, and that's, I think that's a really good question, you know, as it regards to, you know, marinas, to mooring sites, to broadside mooring, to commercial, to industrial ship. I mean, all those things coming in to also all the privates that are out there. Um, we have several, you know, um, uh, you know private uh, dock systems. You know, it's in, in, and I think they that the Harbor Advisory Committee's got a really difficult, you know, they got a really difficult process to kind of work, you know, to help work this out. Um, but it's also really good because I think I think we're all looking to put our best foot forward, you know, so to speak. Um, this fund is is like the tourist park uh, uh, campground fund is an enterprise account. Uh, which means it is uh, supposedly it's supposed to be self-sufficient, not not subsidized by the general fund. The good story this year is it is not subsidized by the general fund. We are presenting a budget that actually shows, uh, at the end of the day, some dollars being held at, in reserve, um, and that's a good thing. Um, hasn't always been the case, but it's, it is the case this year. Uh, when you look at the revenues, one of the things that I would bring out is we do anticipate a 6% increase again this year. As you know, the commission at one point had said that they would continue to increase the rates by 6%. Um, we are on year four of seven years, and at the end of seven years, we wanted to reevaluate and see where we are with them. Um, and so we are anticipating a 6% increase in those rates for next year. Uh, in terms of the revenues, they're pretty flat, um, and so that's there's not much to, I guess, expound on in, in terms of uh, the expenditures. They're really pretty much we're anticipating the same expenditures as we had the previous year. Um, I guess if I could make one point, it would be the cost of ser or cost of sales, and really those are the those are the fuel. That's uh, our fuel costs are when we purchase fuel, but they're offset in our sales, and you'll see that our sales are higher than our than our costs. Okay. I have a question for Gary. I guess um, is the tourist park an enterprise fund also? Uh, yes, sir. It is. Why don't we have depreciation there like we do for the marinas? Because there's really not much there to uh, depreciate. <laughs> it's mostly just land. Because so. I, you know, when we were looking at the budget, I was thinking, gee, it would be nice to draw, a, you know, show revenues, then draw a subtotal for expenses, and then, like we, we have here, you put the reserve down, you know, because so, we have expenses exceeding revenues in the marinas with the depreciation. And, uh, but you can see that easily enough when you look at the addition to reserves. So, I mean, the, the, the one office doesn't depreciate that much, or, or it's fully depreciated? It, most the buildings are <laughs> there are fully depreciated, and, but they're still in good shape. So. I, I, I could have asked this any time, but administrative charges includes all administration? Just, just for the definition of Correct. That. Uh, we talked a little bit about that last night. That's the administrative overhead that we spread out to each of the utility funds. <laughs> That's, uh, you know, like city manager's time, city attorney time, finance time, time HR time. Right. And we just spread that out. And as uh, Bill mentioned yesterday, that's also mandated in the city charter that we treat it that way. I assume that was the case, but I just wanted to get kind of a definition of what was all included in there. Yeah. So there, it's is, just there is no other category like that. This, this is all-encompassing of those. Correct. Yes. Yeah. 
other than technology fee or things. City manager. Doing it that way is a city charter requirement, and it's from a philosophical standpoint, it's just a basic control to make sure that there's no favoritism. That, um, that certain certain expenses of the city aren't getting a break and raising costs for other other consumers and other services in the city. So here it is, pretty good job. It calculates out basically what that what that common element is that goes across the whole city and that's what that line item is. Do you have something, Commissioner Capenzi? Um, just to comment on the work session we had, I thought it was a great work session. I think we did leave the Harbor Advisory Committee with a big charge um, to kind of go out and study and come back to us. Um, you know, but we also touched on, you know, just doing a, a citywide um, you know, harbor harbor study or just lakeshore study. You know, what what do we want to see our lakeshore and lakefront look like, and and where should we be investing? And I think it's critical that we start doing that now. Um, you know, just to make sure that we're putting the money where people want to be, we're putting the money um, in the type of services people want. I think, um, you know, as long as they can pay for themselves, I'm all for it. As long as um, you know, there's a, a way or a will to make it successful. I think, I think it's a win-win. I think it does add a lot to our city. Um, but I think it's going to be critical. I don't know if we charge the Harbor Advisory with a time frame to come back, or if they're just. I don't know how we left that, but. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. You did not give them a specific charge, but they understand the urgency. We've had, as you're well aware, very many studies done on different components. We've had a lot of town hall meetings and public engagement on uh, on waterfront interest to try to get a gauge for that. The Harbor Advisory Committee, when it, during their last annual report to the City Commission, tacitly stated that they understood the critical need to do that and their willingness to step up to help drive that re requirement. And so it's my understanding from speaking to our, our staff liaison that they're working very hard to try to make these things happen as quickly as they can. Any other commissioners? Any other comments? If not, we'll proceed on to uh, page 190, 190, which is the Cinder Pond, Pond Marina, 595-765. This was an interesting. Um, <laughs> this was an interesting uh, facility this year, and, and I guess you know what it, facility. <laughs> you know, I, I guess here. <laughs> in, you know, of all the things that happened, it, it, if I can, if I can say that it did, it, it did something for the facility is is that it um, it extended the life um, in that. This year, we actually paid the bonds off, the, so the principal and interest, which was approximately $90,000 a year. That's come off the books. Um, and so this fund really has an opportunity to start assembling some reserve. Um, and so and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But um, So even though it was crazy and we had to work really hard, I think there might be some really good things that come out of it uh, from a long-term perspective. Um, in terms of positions, we're not... We're not suggesting any additional positions. Um, the program statistics are uh, available. If you have any questions on that, if not, then um, you know, I'll move on to the actual budget itself. Uh, if there aren't any, then we'll go to 191. Um, the uh, revenues are primarily the transient, the uh, fuel sales, and then the slip rentals. Um, once again, the slip rentals, we're anticipating a 6% increase based on the policy that we've been following. Um, so you see your uh, the anticipated revenues. If you look down to the expenditures, uh, the one that I would point out as being uh, in something that we have that you'll see an increase increases the repair and maintenance supplies as the facility gets older that's the repair and maintenance supplies will continue to go up 
and so we can anticipate that. And those are just just standard maintenance items that we have to continue to provide um, as these facilities get older. The good news story, um, if you look down and you look at the Marina Reserve, uh, we're anticipating uh, 58,000 and some change going into reserve this year. And so if you can anticipate, if you can think about this, we did get, um, we are anticipating work on the piers as well as the marina facility, the harbor ser service building, and that just continues to extend that life of those facilities. You know, our hope is that we will continue to work on increasing those revenues um, to, you know, establish that reserve to where as we move forward and have to have significant or heavy maintenance or, and or replacement, you know, we will have enough in reserve to actually offset, you know, to, to, to uh, pay for um, or match those grant funds as we move forward. So this is really a, a good news story. Any questions on right. revenues Just and expenditures? Going back to fact sheets in... Uh, Cinder Pond Marine, you got 2012-2013. Is that a typo on, should that be 2013, 2014 um, for the program statistics? And on okay. Presque Isle, we have 2014-2013. Well, those are the actual he has. We don't, since we haven't completed 14 yet. Oh, yes. But we, I see what you're saying, and yes, it is. It should be 12 and 13. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Well, oh, you mean on Pascal should be 12 and 13? Correct. Okay. Should it be 2012 oh, okay. to the left and 2013 to the right? We'll make a note to switch those around next year. We try to make them consistent. It's, um, yeah, it should be 12 the first column, Nothing 13 <laughs> the second <laughs> column. It, you put the, the, the previous year to the left and the current year to the right. Um, both it's. That's what, yeah, it should be 12 the first in the first column, 13. Okay, so in, on Presque Isle where we had transit system rentals, last year we had 18, or this year, or most recently we had 29. Or is that? These statistics are the latest full year statistics. We have. I understand that, yep. but. Carl's saying is we, the column that was 2014 on paper is 2012. The column okay. is 2015. Good, because I, I was looking, at it looks like we're decreasing in, in, in in uh, transit slip rentals, but we're increasing. Okay. Here for Tim Stonehouse. Um, one question and uh, a comment, I guess. Um, any thought when we're going to put out the RFP on the new Marina Shack? September. September? Yep. Uh, we're anticipating. Um, that's a good, thanks for asking the question. Uh, we're hoping to uh, put it on the street in September with the uh, thought that um, um, we would uh, have it prepared for bid by the first of the year. We think that's when we would get the best bids. Mm -hmm. um, so within the first few weeks of January, try to have it on the street. Um, that's our thought. Good. Thank you. Um, comment if I, if I might. Um, Interesting comparison if you look on Presque Isle versus Cinder Pond, and I'm up at the top where you're making money on the revenue side. You're looking at about $2,300 in transient sales at Presque Isle. You're looking at 15500 at Cinder Pond. You're looking at about $3,400 in uh, about, about 20500 in fuel sales at Presque Isle, and you're looking at about 87000 for Cinder Pond. And what, and the same thing goes down true for revenue earned and everything. And what it, it shows very dramatically is the old ideas that Richard Florida was advocating for so many years on economic development and how a marina in the right place increases property values around it, but also provides a destination that people want to be in terms of going out and doing other things. So again, very stark numbers when you compare the two. One, one marina that is in a, a relatively park-like setting next to an ore dock away from everything, and another one that's right in the heart of everything. So again, just bearing in mind as we go forward with other decisions. Thank you. Commissioner Kim Benzie. Just a question. When we look at the reserve, uh, marina reserve on both of them, we don't have a, a total in that fund. I think next year, if I 
could request maybe just having that in there just kind of a a total amount uh, maybe for all of them I mean including tourist park I think it'd just be helpful to know how much we how much we do have in those that would that is a good idea for all the enterprise funds if we could put maybe the the uh, the last you know the last reserve amount from the, the capper would be you know a footnote somewhere for breach I think that'd be real helpful yeah. thank you sir that was the clarification I was looking for all enterprise funds yeah yeah I think so utilities too but we could put them in the notes mm -hmm. that'd be yeah. good okay. and one one more note not related to this um it would be helpful or, or at the very least interesting to know how much um, I guess we aren't demanding from the BLP in, in revenue I know we've never collected that but it might be nice to show what we don't take from the utility um, as per the charter payment lieu taxes mm -hmm. uh, that sort of be. my interpretation is it would be half of the net income that the charter calls uh, that by resolution if the City Commission chose to ask for half of the net income uh, annual net income from the BLP it could be transferred into the city's general we can, fund we can transfer 100% of this net income no no but, but I think what Commissioner Ken no, was su suggesting was for the BLP no 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 I, it's I think what I what I heard what I think the suggestion one was in, in the city charter uh, the City Commission has the ability per resolution to have the BLP transfer half of their net income into the general fund every year and uh, to the best of my ability in researching this uh, the City Commission has never opted to do that um, it, there's a lot of speculation about a lot of those different issues but I believe, Commissioner, that was the that was the fund that you were speaking to, not the not the taxes or the, um, the right. But I thought it was um, just the revenue. Is is that? What's that? Are you talking about BLP now? For or the or charter, the BLP. Sorry. Okay. Um, it's the net income. Half the net income. We can we can. Oh, it is. Transfer. Okay. Mr. Coin. Um, I have a question to the city manager, Gary. What was the net income last year? Zero. Well, the, for the latest year, sir, the net income, as reported by BLP, subject to their upcoming budget vote, uh, was 1.5 million. Uh, so for this year, that number would be 750 thousand. Hmm. I motion. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think before we had an independent board, I think the city was was doing that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I wrote a white paper uh, for for the commissioners present. I, I I did a white paper study, kind of of the history, and it was a pleasure to do it because I had some of our our residents, such as Marion Sonderegger and the Fraser family, people who were directly participating, give me kind of a blow by blow from 1959 up until about. 1971 uh, to give me a good understanding of that and uh, there there's a lot of history with the issue and there's a lot of speculation with the issue uh, it, it's truly a reflection of its day and the and the growth of Marquette at a pivotal moment in time um, I've heard lots of different dialogue I wouldn't suggest we enter into as part of this budget discussion about uh, the pros or cons of asking for something like that but just to, to, to answer Commissioner Cambenzi's question the net income as reported by BLP this year is uh, 1.5 million the uh, ability under the city charter to ask for half of that is specifically stated and that would that would make that amount 750,000 and the charter specifically says it would be transferred into the city's general fund for use as the commission may see fit. It also says we can budget that. Mm -hmm. But Go ahead. bear in mind, they would they use those same resources for investing in future development. They would then propose to raise rates, to raise more money, so they would have adequate income to make future investments I'm not here to defend them but I mean it's not as simple mm -hmm. as just saying that they've yeah. took a million and a half dollars and yeah. stuck it somewhere yeah no nope. uh, 
Well, I think that's the crux of history is um, it, <laughs> it wouldn't affect rates because it's net income. It's, it's yeah, after yeah. all of their other budgets and plans and expenses and everything else has been accounted for. It's part of that overage that's left over that they then would do something with. So it, the, it doesn't directly impact rates. They would argue, uh, and I believe the, the last discussion the City Commission had on this, the last joint work session, is they, they use the money exactly as you've said for other future investments. And, and the, the dialogue where the City Commission and BLP Board last left it was it's critically important uh, that we resolve our energy strategy in the area. And understanding how they're investing those dollars is still unresolved. Uh, so just as in my view, rather, rather than have that discussion, particularly when they're not here to inform that view, uh, it, it, we would be best, I think we would be best served to understand how they would use that money before, before we would exercise that authority. Before we budget it. <laughs> and how does this relate to the Cinder Pond Marina? That might be a bigger question. I don't know. Just, just <laughs> showing, just in the budget, showing any reserves we have or therefore. Were you talking about marina reserves now or BLP reserves? How did you get enterprise. BLP reserves? Well, enterprise, but also. Okay. I see. Okay. I follow. Oh, okay. I understand what you're saying. So we should put the library reserves in here too, if they have any. <laughs> but I guess uh, any other comments on arena funds or or anything, or should we move ahead to the from the marina to the arena? Well, believe it or not, we're at the last fund. Are we still something on last on marina? No, we don't. Okay, we're oh. we're on to uh, we, no. Okay, we're moving Lakeview forward. Lakeview Arena Good. Fund, uh, five nine eight, and it starts on page one ninety two. Um, this was one of the one of the accepted uh, ten percent options that uh, the administration took that we proposed um, with this year's budget and. Um, the big thing with this year's budget is to really narrow the ice season. Um, in the past, we've uh, in the past we've had you know as much as 11, 11 months of ice that is you know proceeded into the summer, and we've continued to restrict it, restrict it, or constrict it. Um, and what we're suggesting with this year's budget would be um, in October one, so to March fourteenth. Which would constrict it about six weeks. We run on typically a, a nine uh, or 29 week season, so we would we would make it 23 weeks, and with that, uh, we would see some pretty significant savings. The, the biggest part of it is going to be the electric utility rate. Um, when we fire up the compressors, especially when it's warm outside, to cool that floor down um, in August, which sometimes might be our warmest months, um, there's a pretty significant uh, spike, and what that results in is uh, pretty significant demand costs, as well as uh, you know some of the all you know the fuel costs. Um, in, in addition to just the you know KWs that we're paying for, um, and so uh, what we're suggesting is that, uh, and and certainly this would be something that would be, you know, perhaps not you know this October one, but. Because we need to work with our user groups, <laughs> this would be October 1, 2015. But but we're, we are talking about shortening up the end of this season, so March 14, 2015, um, and October 1, 2015, with the proposed change. Um, you know, we would see some significant cost reductions just in terms of the, the power usage. Um, we do, and we would anticipate some issues um, in terms of we do have some tournaments. Uh, both uh, early, one is the old timers tournament, and so we would need to work with those folks to see if we can't shift them into the first weekend in, in October, and this would give us a year to kind of do that. Um, we can sort of foreshadow it with those folks when they when they're here this year with all of the participants, and then work to uh, to move it into uh, the first weekend in October. Um, we'd also, you know, we'd have uh, to work with uh, pigs in heat and perhaps the walls if, in fact. Uh, they do make the uh, the playoffs. 
Um, and we can certainly work with the Barry, and we've got a good relationship with them to shift, you know, for either practices, games, those types of things as we move forward. So it would, you know, we are saying, you know, sort of constrict the season a little bit, um, you know, specifically with the end of this season and the beginning of next. Um, and we think that that would be some uh, significant savings, specifically with uh, our, um, our power usage. Um, but in addition to that, we would have some, you know, pretty significant, well, six weeks of uh, Zamboni, you know, so we have Zamboni drivers and, and some of the other maintenance that goes along with the ice that uh, would be put off until that time, you know, so. Um, yeah. Commissioner Coyne? Um, could you be specific when you say significant? What, what are you talking about? Well, you know, what we looked at this year is, you know, we're, we're looking at close to $40,000 worth of savings. Okay. Um, basically 40000 a month to maintain ice sheets? Well, it's, it's Roughly. yeah, but, you know, in, in, it also includes some of the labor that goes into it, you know. Um, so the Zamboni drivers as well as the electronic or electrical utility rates. Yeah, that's part of yep. maintaining yep. the ice sheets. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Stonehouse. Um, so you're saying how much a week then would be saved by cutting a week? Well, we 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 broke it out in that it would be you know the gross savings would be about seventy five five and the you know after revenue loss we figured it'd be about forty seven one in terms of the, the total saving savings for the six weeks. So we'd save about how much money then total? About forty seven thousand. Seven thousand. Yeah, about that. Um, a concern, I'm not advocating it, I'm just putting it on the table, is that I know there's a number of tournaments that come into town beginning and end of season, and those are looked on um, with great favor by the local hoteliers and restaurants. So if you were to cut those tournaments out, there would be a ripple effect through the community in terms of money not circulating. In other words, it's, it's beyond, it is more more complicated than simply the city saving that money by cutting a week it would be the local business community that would be losing that money circulating. And, you know, what we would really try to work on is, you know, some of the tournaments you speak of is like the Mayo, you know, which is a figure skating, you know, and that's a big, that's a big event. Um, you know, we would, we would be working really hard to get them into the season that we do have, mm -hmm. you know. So we're not, we're not advocating, you know, you know, eliminating these tournaments or not having these tournaments. We just want to, we want to concentrate the use within the 23 weeks that are there. I, I, I understand that. I'm only trying to point out that many of those tournaments are well set in time. Mm -hmm. And the reason the dates are selected are selected is because they're often built around other tournaments in other places. So there's a ripple effect not only financially in the community, but a ripple effect in terms of other tournaments being affected, other places. So it will be an interesting exercise to see how well that works. So are you saying that you <coughs> you would make this move if you could accommodate all the tournaments? If you were if we were to lose one or two tournaments, you would not make this move? Or? No, I I think this would. I think it's probably the right move to make. Um, I think it's extremely expensive in that first six weeks mm -hmm. to put ice in um, when it is hot. I mean, it's a it's an uninsulated barn. And, you know, the concrete is extremely thick. We've got a lot of rebar. It takes a lot of energy to cool that floor down. We're fighting that 55 degrees below, you know, below that, that grade. And um, so the first six weeks are, are extremely expensive for us. And so if we were to put it off to where it's maybe a little bit more temperate, it would be, it'd be not as big of a spike. And we, we would anticipate, you know, some savings. Commissioner Kimbenzi? Well, I certainly understand that I mean we basically shut the auditorium down in the summer because to run the air conditioning unit um, we're losing every minute it's on um, I certainly see the value um, in what Commissioner Stonehouse brought up and and hopefully we can move those um, so they can still happen um, I do have one question I know the compressors there we did have to do kind of an emergency uh, financial uh, amendment because one of them failed last winter was it um, if, if we were to invest in new compressors would that savings be huge probably yeah that's something that um, 
that we're we're kind of you know going to look at this year. Um, obviously, the compressors are old. We continue to rebuild them. You see a rebuild in this budget, um, and you know some of the things that we're going to be looking at is is how they're sequenced, and um, you know as you as you uh, the floor gets colder or it it heats up, and I say heats up anywhere from 13 to 17 degrees, there can be significant power savings or power loss based upon the fluctuations and so that's going to be one of the things that we're we're looking at managing you know managing that efficiency this year the other thing is the thickness of the ice you know we need to make sure that we're managing the thickness because as it gets thicker obviously there's more power that we're putting out to create it so making sure that there's a uniform surface um, that's another power savings and it doesn't sound like a lot but it's exponential once it gets back to a compressor, you know. And so, um, yeah, I, we will be looking. I mean, certainly you're, you're always, you know, wondering if they're, I mean, the new compressors are, are more efficient, certainly. City Manager. Thank you, Your Honor. I, I just wanted to remind, uh, this was one of the examples we used yesterday in describing the 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 theme of this year's budget, which is buying time. And to the extent that we'll have one or two tranches between now and potentially when some of this discussion about what the uh, tournament demands might be and the concerns that the commission might have to make sure that we're effectively managing that w with the least possible disruption, this is a good news story for us because we, we have a fair amount of time between now and the end of March okay. not only to work with those user groups, but also should revenue firm up. This is very easily something that, that if Carl uh, made the determination that uh, the impact was going to be too great, he could. it's a lot easier for him to make the call to leave ICE up another week than to, than to restart the whole process at the beginning of the year. So it, it's important to, to recall this is really just the baseline start of the year and the strategy Carl's going to use to try to manage expenses. But this is one of those good news stories where we have a lot of flexibility throughout the year to make changes if we need to. Commissioner Ryan, Commissioner Ryan. Yeah, um, and, and you said you're talking about next October. Mm -hmm. When are you going to put the ice in this year? It would be the first week of September. Okay. Have you, do you, do you know specifically if the Barry could accommodate some of those events and that we're talking about uh, potentially losing? Well, the big, the big event would be the Old Timers Tournament. And unfortunately, it's our largest event throughout the whole year, and it's the third week of September, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is crazy. But, um, but it's our reality. And so, uh, no, no, the Barry couldn't. I mean, they, they use two sheets, and, and, and sometimes they spill over into the Barry. Okay. So, I mean, this is something that we, we would really want to get them, you know, we really want to get them to, to accommodate them the first weekend in, in October, you know. So that would be something that we'd be working with them immediately to see if we can negotiate that and get that, you know, firmed up. You know, some of the other events could be accommodated by the Barry? Well, that's at that I, time of year. I mean, early like that. That's in that, and that's our issue is we put the ice in, and that's predominantly the the event. Um, and then you know we may get some miscellaneous um, ice sales, but the predominant. I mean, there there really isn't any other events. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we the, unfortunately the the prime time for use of berry coincides with all the scholastic use of berry. Right. And so there, it's very difficult to to change around their program because uh, very similar to what the conference facilities are like and and why we can't plan multi-year events or events two or three years out is they can't make that kind of commitment. Their first priority is to make it available for student athletes and for the learning programs. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying they should. I'm just wondering if we know, you know, I don't know what the events even are. Uh, Commissioner Stonehouse apparently does, you know, so. Um, I don't have any names to them, uh, Commissioner Ryan, but I, I know there's high school groups that are up here, little mites groups, and, you know, different hockey organizations bring them in. Right. And I know that they, they really fill local hotels and restaurants, and I'm very concerned that we do anything that would would impact the economic health of our, our community. Right. I agree. So. Yeah, that's, that's why I say if there is some other way to accommodate, then it would be good to know. Well, the Royals start in September, don't they? Yeah, and... 
you know, that's one that we would have to work, you know, with uh, the berry. You know, they're they're pretty flexible. They have been flexible um, because their their players aren't necessarily going to school, so they have some flexibility. They they have been using non prime time ice, so they go in the morning and they you know they might be able to use the berry part or the berry uh, uh, ice sheet um, and during their non prime times. Oh, just that. Um, my only comments were. Um, that would be my concern because we didn't have the Royals before and considering they brought in 32000 last year for mm -hmm. us and that we're saving 47000 I mean, yeah, that's a lot of money, but I would hope I don't want them to go away. So I And I trust your judgment that you will work with them. And I just wanted to applaud you for doing such a great job of creative budgeting throughout this whole thing because it's, it's good. <laughs> so I appreciate it. Mayor Pro Tem Storehouse. Um, what happened to the dog show? I noticed the dog show left the arena and now out there at the, you know, God's end of the earth, I guess. Fair. Fairgrounds. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> you know, I, I, I guess I can't answer the okay. question for all of the special <laughs> events that come in. And they, you know, it's, it's whatever is their trend and, you know, the space that they need, their needs may change over time. And, um, you know. It, I, I guess I can't speak for them. Staff probably th are glad that the dogs are gone. <laughs> Who chased the dogs out? <laughs> Commissioner Kamenzi, did you have something further? Um, real quick, just so we can get out of here. I'm sensing it's almost time. Well, we haven't gone through the, the, the actual numbers yet. <laughs> yeah. Um, just out of curiosity, though, one. One thing that has helped Kaufman is to do a, a per ticket fee, um, just a facility fee. It's a minimal dollar per ticket, um, and it, it goes back into the facility for things we need. It, has that ever been talked about for Lakeview? Well, there has been by contract, um, you know, percentage of um, of whatever the ticket proceeds are. Um, we do not have that in our in our contracts at this point um, you know if that's something and like I said that's all by contract and the Royals already have a multi-year contract um, they pay a, a premium for the ice if you if you remember in those for the their tournament ice they pay more than what we have in here um, because they are events um, but yeah, it's not something that I mean it might be something we could look into like with the high school High school typically fills the, you know, fills the, the arena, um, and then some of the, the junior hockey, you know. But we don't. Okay, I, and you know, it might be something that in three years, you know, if that clears us of all the contracts, it's it's something that I've found um, the community doesn't mind paying for because they appreciate the facility and. Um, if you explain it to the groups that really this it isn't a charge to you it's it's you know raising your ticket price fifty cents or something um, it's gone over great for us um, just a thought if we can get out I guess from all the contracts because I, I do think it needs to start kind of yep. with everyone not just one so if you want me How to go over down to two thirty one five what's that <laughs> How do we get down to 231.5? <laughs> well, I think the big, some of the big ones, the big is the, um, is, is certainly the savings from the, uh, the year that we had. We're also, I mean, and by constricting the year, we're also anticipating more ice rentals. So by increasing our ice rates, um, we're going to be, Right around 390,000, 395,000. We also had, would anticipate more with our rentals. I mean, all of our space in the building has been rented in terms of office space, commercial space. This year we have the uh, superior hockey that's you know a, a tenant in the building. Um, so all of our all of our usable space that's that's saleable is. I mean, we've. Um, I think we've done a pretty good job in making sure that it's that it's rented. Um, we will be putting an RFP on the street for concessions, um, so we anticipate having that, and maybe that would be even, you know, 
a, a good story for us as we move forward. Um, in um, on the expenditure side, um, you can see that we're pretty much status quo from where we were two years ago. Um, the we do include a capital equipment, and that's part of the capital budget. We've already been to you all on the glycol pumps. Um, you know, the big piece that we see is a reduction in power usage, and that's that's a big number. <laughs> Are we any questions on the? The revenues or expenses. We're finished with Carl then. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. You're welcome. So are anything anything additional from any commissioners? <laughs> 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 that was a quick